Welcome back, everyone, to the Bourbon and BS podcast. This is episode 118. I've got some special guests with me already on the screen. So if you guys are following along, if you guys are listening on just the audio, know that every week on Facebook and YouTube Live, we broadcast live where you can actually tune in and join the conversation. I'm trying to bring it up right now, and there it is. So uh, I have two special guests from Nat Sherman Cigars. Michael Herklotz, he's at the bottom of your screen. Michael, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. And uh, Kylie Boudreau. Hi. Who uh, some of you know if you uh, are uh, friends of the uh, the Tinderbox at Easton, one of our sponsors. Um, and I will say with Tinderbox at Easton, they are one of our sponsors. We appreciate the support. They are the ones that kind of bring us together. And uh, I'm smoking, we're all three of us are smoking the Timeless Supreme and this is, uh, we'll get into the cigar, a little bit more information about the cigar, but actually one of my favorites out of your guys' portfolio. So uh, thank you, Tinderbox. I do want to mention for those that are are uh, following along with Bourbon and BS podcast and some other things, we uh, have had some great specials over this uh, stay at home order. And uh, this week we are doing at the Tinderbox at Easton, the stay at home ish order. <laughs> and uh, Ohio has kind of opened up a little bit. So as you're getting back out there, we're Tinderbox is not quite open to the public yet. Still doing curbside, but they do have this stay at home ish special and it is 25 ish percent off and it is 70 ish retail. So out the door after tax, it's a little bit more, but before tax is forty nine ninety five. So ish. this is seven, seven different cigars. And there is a Nat Sherman Metropolitan Maduro that is included in that. It's basically for those that have been taking advantage of this from our sponsor, Tinderbox at Easton, there are six cigars from the previous six samplers. So you have the, let's scroll across the bottom, Nat Sherman Metropolitan Maduro, the Espinosa Habano, the H. Upman Hispaniola, Rocky Vitell LB1, Alec Bradley Tempest Nicaragua, Don Lino Africa, and the BS Gold. So killer one. Uh, I know they're selling a lot of them today. Also want to thank Altidus USA for the uh, sponsorship this year. They're always supporting us. I do have a second cigar here. Uh, we typically will get the second cigar from them, but uh, I know you guys have more Nat Shermans. I've got a Monte Cristo Nicaragua series that is made by AJ Fernandez for Altidus. So Altidus, Josh Bentley, and Paul Waller, thanks for all the help with uh, sponsoring the show. And also the BS Cigar Company, we appreciate the support. The gold and silver are back in stock, and they are shipping, selling, all that good stuff for you guys as well also the patreon page patreon.com bourbon and bs podcast this will get you uh, a chance to support us why are you laughing kyle Kylie, hey, well that's all the time we have guys thanks so much for <laughs> tuning in <laughs> you got to get those out of the way sometimes it's been Kylie, great man really <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys want to say something no kyle always makes fun of this since we've been doing this because now this is like if you watch the video basically she calls this qbc so you got like things showing up you have all this stuff. it's yeah Anyways, well, and well, welcome. Thank you for, for putting up with uh, all the, uh, the sponsorship information. Tonight, we're doing something a little different. Kylie's going to teach us, and I think I'm the only one that's actually going to attempt to make this. And because we are so far apart and because we don't have all the, the ingredients necessarily, I'm going to do a uh, somewhat of a Sazerac cocktail, which apparently Sazerac -ish. Mike -ish. Sa Sazerac ish, exactly. <laughs> Michael, this is one of your favorite cocktails, if I'm not mistaken. That's what I was told, at least. Yeah, I'm. I am. A, I am a fan of all um, of the typical, like classic brown spirit cocktails, yeah. particularly uh, those with bourbon and rye. I don't love Scotch cocktails as much. Okay. Um, so Manhattan's probably my lead. Sazerac, old fashioned, probably tied for number two. Yeah. Um, a Boulevardier oh. um, is. Up there for me as a favorite, which is a Negroni, but made with um, brown. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm just, I mean, look, if you're pouring it, I, I'm loving it. You know, you're, no problem. You're not picky picky, but you you know what you like more than others is what it sounds that's, like. I think that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. Okay. So, so Kylie, um, you, you have some bartending experience. A little um, bit. Michael, do you have any bartending experience or just uh, on the other side of the bar like I do? Exclusively other side of the bar. Yes. Yeah. You're in good company uh, here. So you're going to walk us through this. But before we do that, I, I do want to talk mainly about this Timeless Supreme. This is uh, formerly known as, and I don't know if you guys are allowed to say this or not, but this is formerly known as the Timeless Nicaragua, if yep. I'm not mistaken. And uh, 
this, like I said, when this this came out, uh, it definitely kind of blew me away. Uh, I think it's a little different for the Nat Sherman portfolio. Uh, I think it, it's at least in in our shop, it's definitely brought more people to the Nat Sherman name once again, which I, I know that has been a, a goal of the company even prior to the Altria thing. It's 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 something that you're trying to expand, just like any other any portfolio, I think. But there was a, a big big swing working with, uh, I believe, the Placencia family on this one, and then. And Michael, if you could a little bit, I mean, you have a connection, a little bit of background as far as, you know, how this blend became part of the Nat Sherman portfolio, which I think is known for more Dominican tobacco typically. Yeah. So, um, you know, you, you, you said that, that we're in the process of growing. I, I don't know a company on the planet that isn't trying to grow their business. Right. Um, so yeah, we, we certainly remain in growth mode, even at 90 years in, um, for years, we were, I would say, uh, predominantly um, DR, uh, but even in the late 90s and 2000s, we did have quite a bit manufactured in Nicaragua and Honduras. Um, in 2011, we discontinued a lot of that product um, and basically came back to uh, our two original blends from Dominican and our original blend from Honduras, and then really um, kind of level set our portfolio um making sure that we kept our best sellers the things that we had maintained um consistently over you know since the 90s really and then tried to figure out what did our portfolio really need um for us to continue to grow our business um and so we knew quickly that that we needed to um create some blends and bring some products to market that are a little more um new world in style okay. so if i look at what we what we had on the market when timeless was launched in 2012 they really were what i would consider snapshots of the 90s mm -hmm. so there were two blends from the dominican republic metropolitan connecticut metropolitan maduro and our host those are you know if you if you smoke them today they really are snapshots of a moment in time from the 90s that we have we have painstakingly maintained as far as the blends, as far as the blends and okay. more importantly, the experience. Yeah. So not just, you know, saying, Hey, we've maintained the blend the same, even though, you know, the crop is different. So that it may taste different. Quite the contrary. The fact that crops change mean that we have to tweak the blend in order to keep the experience the same. And that's precisely what we're doing. Um, so that's a long way to catch us up to timeless. Timeless was intended to really um, help usher in a new era of Nat Sherman starting in 2012. And um, we did it first with a Timeless collection from the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. um, which even to date remains our, our most award winning. And then the Timeless Nicaragua came out um, shortly thereafter. The, they were both sort of developed in tandem. Um, we ultimately commercialized the Dominican one first, but Nicaragua was quickly on its way. The interesting thing to remember about this cigar, when it released in 2012, that was a time in the industry when um, when Nicaraguan puros were all the rage. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, um, full-bodied, um, lijero-driven Nicaraguan puros were all the rage. Sure. Of course, add to that the popularity of large ring gauges, and you had really 80% of that IPCPR show was large ring gauge um, Nicaraguan either puros or Nicaraguan uh, emphasis, Lajero heavy bombs. Yeah. So we said, you know, how do we play in a space where we're not going to lead the pack? And how do we do it in a meaningful way that's authentic to what we do? And what we do is um, we fill holes. So we have a humidor in our store, just like you have in your store. Sure. And we don't have the big coming soon section. Our, our stores are, our store is full. So we have to make sure if we bring something to market, we're bringing something to market that is going to fill a void in the humidor. What we, where we felt there was a void was a Nicaraguan Puro embracing the ring gauges that people are finding popular in that time but doing it with grace and finesse and not doing it with clobbering strength. 
Yeah, so so follow the trend a little bit, but at the same time put the the Nat Sherman brand name on it, which which means a lot, right? I mean, at least you know to to an industry that's knowing you for something else, you're going to do your own spin on on something that is like you say a snapshot about the '90s for the other blends, but I mean almost like a snapshot for that time. You're 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 taking your own picture. That's right, and it you know how do we we have always been um, uh, a unique voice in the industry. Um, and we bring products to market thoughtfully. So think about it. We've been around 90 years now. It was 82 years when Timeless was released. But even at that time, we were shrinking our portfolio. We weren't growing our portfolio because we want the portfolio to be meaningful, not just to our customers, but yeah. to our retailers who are willing to stock the product. And so no retailer needs um, you know, 60, 80, 100 SKUs necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, from one particular blend or one particular company, they, they need to be able to make sure that they have stuff that's meaningful that customers want to buy. So Timeless, when, when we departed from um, the sort of traditional clock and Indian look of Metropolitan that served us so well for many years, this is what we started with, that yeah. version of Timeless. And I love um, that look. That was... Me, me too. Me too. And in fact, it didn't even have that secondary black. It was just the, the watch face. So and interestingly, those... you had said um, Timeless Nicaragua was the original name. In fact, it was not. The original name was simply Timeless Collection. Yeah. One was made in Nicaragua. One was made in Dominican. We didn't call them out. It was only later in an effort to make it easier that we started referring to it as, as Timeless Nicaragua. They had the same bands, correct? They had the same bands. But Timeless Nicaragua was box pressed, right. all large ring gauge. Timeless Dominican was round. The boxes were different. Personally, I thought it was enough points of differentiation as I quickly learned it was not. And, uh, you know, I shut up and listened. Sometimes it's, it's, it, it is tough if you don't have someone in the, the humidor with you. Right. Uh, and you're not shopping, say online, you're in your brick and mortar. And it depends on, on what your level of, uh, education is on on the, the particular brand so it, yeah I, I think it could have been confusing i do like though i like both looks obviously but for those listening on the audio he held up a, a, a almost original i call it the the marketing behind it and it is a slightly it's it's familiar but it is it, it's, it's definitely different uh, as far as the the branding went on that and it's a uh, Almost more of a, in my opinion, it almost had a little bit more of that traditional. I don't want to call it retro, but a little bit. Yeah. Uh, it, it has a little bit of that. That said, though, I'm really happy with how we sort of tweaked it, and um, oh, yeah. you know, now that's a that's a very hip expression. We also added a, a, a color difference too, so it's even more recognizably different from yeah. um, what was the timeless Dominican and now some of the others. And the, and the boxes are different as well, correct? Boxes are different, um, a little closer now than they were in the past, but mm -hmm. still, I mean, now that every, every blend within timeless is very distinctly unique and identifiable, which obviously makes a lot of sense. So yeah, you were right. I was wrong. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, here's my question. Cause we've had, you know, we have other, other companies represented on, on this podcast and, and it's interesting to, to uh, me, myself, and then a lot of other people when you do line extensions, when you do the collections, you call it, which is a little different, in my opinion, from what you hear, at least in the cigar industry. Um, you, you see it in, you know, with the bourbon, the whiskey industry as well. You see similar names on there with slight variations of of how they're aging the the product, the juice inside. Um, but with this one in particular, you call it a collection, which, again, I think has a little bit of a, a Nat Sherman type of ring to it because it's not just you know, a line extension or a brand extension. It's, it's more of just a, a collection. But I mean, the question that, that we get a lot of the times is, is how do you put the two together? How, when you say timeless collection, what, I mean, what goes behind the, the marketing behind it? When I, I mean, as far as I can tell, I mean, you go from the prestige and you go to uh, the, the, the Supreme, very, very different tobacco, very different smoking experiences, but they're both timeless. You have the Sterling now, which is part of the timeless collection, correct? That's right. And, and Panamericana is the fourth. And they all are, are as, as you say, couldn't be more different from one another. Right. Um, but a collection suggests that it's something you want to hold on to and preserve. Sure. Uh, a selection um, suggests it's for a moment. 
um, an addition is something that's that's at one moment in time never to be repeated. Sure. Uh, a collection is something that you hold and you preserve, and that's how we approach our blends. You know, we don't just make it once and send it out to market, and then it becomes your problem to sell. Um, and, and we certainly don't make it once in the next year as crops start changing or, or the, the way certain, certain tobaccos perform, start changing the, the blend say, well, you know, it is what it is. We're going to make a new selection. We're going to make a new limited edition. You know, you don't stick around 90 years, uh, jumping from one thing to another. You stick around 90 years by, by curating something that's meaningful, not just to us, but to our, our consumers and to our retail partners. Yeah. And then, and then preserving it in every way to me, that's a collection. So when you look at whether it's now timeless prestige, formerly uh, timeless Dominican timeless Supreme, formerly um, timeless Nicaragua, the Pan Americana and the Sterling all very different. Um, but by calling it a collection, this really is a collection of four very unique blends that are inimitable. When mm -hmm. you go to any other company um, you go to any other humidor or any other cigar in your humidor, these cigars stand out. Um, Metropolitan, they are terrific. I'd say they're unique and stand out because they've been so consistent for almost 30 years. Sure. But at the end of the day, they represent a snapshot of a time. Um, and so when you compare a Metropolitan Connecticut to other cigars of the era, made in Dominican, mild blends, Connecticut and Maduro availability. You know, I'm not sure that they smoke as radically different as some of those others do in the same category. I do think that when you smoke them now side by side, ours tastes far closer to the original 30 years ago than a lot of um, my competitors. Sure. But but I would still say that that makes more of sense as a selection, metropolitan selection, um, because it really is snapshot. But, yeah. but you know, the idea of this meaningful collection is why we call it timeless collection. I like that. Like I said, I like it. I like, I like this. It, it, I, I call it like a spin on the, the a similar idea, but I mean, after the explanation, obviously you get a little bit more from that and I, it makes a lot more sense. And I'm, I'm, I appreciate that with this particular cigar. I mean, let me ask you this, because, you know, everyone represents, uh, you know, Kylie included, you represent a, a brand. It's just like being in the retail side of it, right? Um, you, you have a lot of different bands. You got a lot of different boxes. You got a lot of different blends. And uh, where does this rank for both of you guys as far as, like, in the portfolio? Is this up your, your alley? Is it, uh, you know, not, not more mild typically? I mean, I classify this as going to be, and I'm interested to see what you guys have to say about that, too more of that medium plus to medium full as far as the strength and just a, a lot of flavor, full flavor for sure. I'll, I'll tell you first things first. There is, there really is not a blend in our portfolio that I don't enjoy. Yeah. Um, and I think part of that may be selfish because I helped create them. Some of it is also helping to maintain them and making sure that they're good. So um, I do feel a particular vested interest, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but there, certainly in some of the larger portfolios of companies i mean i've i've had reps come in and hand me a product and and say you know that one's uh that one's all right you know yeah. i don't i don't feel that way about any of our products i that's mean I, I don't think there's anything that's just all right i think our products every one of them from metropolitan from the 90s right up through timeless and into our limited editions i think our products are extraordinary um just because of how consistent they are not to mention, obviously, the, the the quality and how they're made. But for me, Timeless Supreme, it was the second one I did, so I'm a little bit nostalgic too about it. Yeah. Um, but I find it has a real, it has everything I love about Nicaragua, without beating me uh, over the head. And there are times that I actually like the the more ferocious, lejero heavy, mm -hmm. um, timeless bombs, and we don't make those. Yeah. So when I really want to be clobbered over the head with a bomb, um, then I walk into your humidor, I walk into our humidor, and I see what else is out there, and I look at my competitors' products, and I say, okay, you know, they do this well, let me smoke that instead. Yeah. Um, so I would put this really in a in a body. If we're going one to ten, I would put it in a body 
that is in the six to seven range, but strength and flavor certainly closer to the five middle range. Okay. So I think there's great body, great mouthfeel, um, but without the specific ferocity of higher priming tobaccos, more typical of Nicaraguan puros. Yeah, and I think it could be a little deceiving on the shelf too when they look at the the wrapper on it, and then you know, know it's all Dominic or know it's all uh, Nicaraguan. I mean, it's it's just something that might even hearing that. I mean, it is something that it, it, it to me it looks like again with the bigger ring gauges, with the box press, with the overall you know overall appeal. You might think that you are going to get hit over the head with like a nicotine drip, you know, and it, it's not so the case. What, what you, I Pat? appreciate though is the feedback that most people will say they were so. Um, pleased that they weren't affected by it, that yeah. they got to enjoy it without being exhausted when it was over. Yeah. Kylie, go for it. Well, so am I unmuted? Okay. Uh, you're, yeah, you're unmuted. I had to double check. Um, I heard somebody say a while back that there's no bad whiskeys, just some that are better than others. And I believe that fully about everything that we sell. There's definitely sizes that I don't care for. But like I'm smoking the five five six, and I always V cut them because mm-hmm. I think a box press with a V cut is just it's different, and that's the only it's the only shape or size that I really V cut. Um, for me, I smoke a lot of more milder Connecticut and Ecuadorian wrap cigars, so this is a little bit more than seven for me. But that's comparative to everything else that I smoke, I generally reach for something a little bit lighter because I want to smoke four and five and six cigars in a day. I don't want to smoke, you know, three Gordos. I don't want to be there for eternity trying to smoke something. So I'll pick a five, five, six or, you know, any Robusto or Corona size or, or something in a 38 ring gauge. Even I prefer something like that versus any of the bigger ring gauges, but you know, it's all up to personal preference about what people prefer. But I do agree that we don't make anything that's going to kick your butts. But when you do look at it, it's got a very dark wrapper. And so that can be a little bit intimidating. But I kind of feel that way about the Maduro, too. About the the Metropolitan Maduro. It's very deceiving. People get really, like, freaked out when it's sitting next to the Connecticut that it's going to kick their butts. But I think as an industry, though, (laughs) we've, we've done a really good job of educating people that dark doesn't mean strong. You know, that was certainly not the case during the cigar boom, but um, that was a message that was reinforced over and over and over and over that dark doesn't mean strong. Doesn't mean that it can't be strong, but that's not an easy um, rush to judgment that one can make, particularly now, you know, back in the 90s, early 2000s, generally dark wasn't strong almost across the board because they were all broadleaf Maduros. Right. Generally, broadleaf Maduros. Um, you know, were not much stronger than their natural counterpart. As Lajero has moved into um, more mainstream uh, within blending, I would actually argue that a lot of lighter wrap cigars would smoke stronger because the contribution of filler um, really is is what drives strength, not wrapper. And so you've got a lot of lighter wrap, um, you know, like an Ecuador Habano uh, shade, or style of wrapper on Lajero bombs um, and talk about deceiving. I have been more deceived by a light wrapper cigar that has put me down oh, yeah. than, uh, than a dark wrapper cigar that has been pleasantly mellower than I expected. Well, I think over the last, uh, you know, for me at least, and I'm not maybe as experienced as the two of you in the industry, as far as time in the industry, but you know, I, I see the last, <clears throat> last 10, 15 years, as almost almost more creativity with more different types of tobacco and i think that's where it comes across because there is still a a, 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 almost like a deception to to the consumer sometimes that they do i mean trust me being the retail side of things it it happens all the time you're like oh that looks too full and it's simply because of the wrapper and there is a constant education there's a constant you have to try it type thing um because you can't it's not like the whiskey side of the world where it's right there on the bottle what the proof is but even that can be you know deceiving as how how that thing you know that bottle will drink but, well and uh, then sometimes as a customer you convince whoever's trying to sell you a cigar that you want to try something and then you end up hating it and that no. happened to me just recently with you steve so 
Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. I just wanted a short cigar, and I picked wrong. Steve told me I wasn't going to like it, and I didn't listen, and I hated it. So so trust yourself, but also trust your tobacconist and your bartender. Well, that's – listen, that's I, – I say that over and over again. People don't work in a cigar shop generally just because it's a hobby. It's yeah. a profession. So use these folks for the as the experts they are and allow them to guide you. Yeah. I'll also say I just saw um I'm trying to see who said it. Tyler in uh, watching is smoking the um the Epoca Limited Edition 2019. It is probably among the fullest blends we make. I think it's stronger than um certainly richer than Panamericana. Um mm-hmm. so you know that is approaching maybe a little more of that mainstream um Nicaragua world and then i saw um someone commented smoking the 652t richard payton mm-hmm. um the 652t is probably my second favorite size after the 546 um in the supreme and 652t um was in cigar fish united's top 25 one year specifically the torpedo interestingly <laughs> both the the timeless number two from the dominican which is a torpedo and our 652t have both been in uh in top top 25 so interesting our torpedoes i think a torpedo smokes, smokes differently and, and depending on the blend sometimes it's one of my favorites just the way that that vitola is i mean honestly i just it just the way it delivers the smoke and everything else i, I didn't i guess we didn't go through the, the full introductions um <laughs> the, i know kylie i saw this Bobby's one. got questions yeah Bobby, uh what's michael's position at nat sherman obviously kylie is our nat sherman queen Calm down, Avi. Calm down. I didn't know if that was, I didn't. I haven't gotten a business card from you, Kylie, so I didn't know that. <laughs> I'll make them. Don't worry. Of course, Michael. What, I mean, if, for the audience, what is your your yeah. title? And uh, you know, I, I know a little bit about your history, obviously, with the company and, and in the industry. But uh, yeah, give everyone a little bit of background, I guess. We sure. Know Kylie's the queen, so I don't know what your if you have a royalty title as well. I don't. No, no, oh, they don't okay. give those out to guys like us. Um, <laughs> My title is vice president of Nat Sherman International. So Nat Sherman International is specifically the um, the side of the company that I run, which is the non-cigarette side of the business. So uh, the premium cigar business, uh, the wholesale team, uh, the product development, product maintenance. And then we have a retail store in Manhattan, um, which we affectionately call the townhouse. Mm. Um, and so that business also reports up to me. So I, I handle both sides of the of the premium cigar retail wholesale business. Um, my, my day to day, um, is kind of obviously overseeing both of those arms and then really liaising with the factory, spending a lot of time on product development, product maintenance, um, the regulatory side of things, you know, all that kind of stuff. I I feel like the last of that one, uh, that list there is, uh, occupying a bit more of your time in the last several years than, than, than it should. It certainly is. I, I don't know. Then it should. Then I hope maybe. Um, hope would be a better word. You're right. You know, but at, at the end of the day, we can't ignore the fact that we are a tobacco product. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think we're proud of the fact that we are a tobacco product and a a significantly different tobacco product um, than the majority of the tobacco products sold on the market. Um, if that means that we have to work a little harder and teach a little harder and um, you know push harder, you know we are. As an industry, and I certainly am not one to to speak to the authenticity of these stories, but we are an industry rooted in resilience. When you look at, right. at um, you know the 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 generation of um, cigar brand owners and factory owners who had to leave Cuba after you know so generously donating everything they had to a dictator um, and having to pack up and go somewhere else many yeah. of which went to Nicaragua and had to quote donate it all over again you know these are real resilient folks um and you know some of the best in our industry so um it's certainly inconvenient um i wish we didn't have to do it but then again uh, maybe if there's any light at the end of the tunnel after we do do it um you know it, it will put us on a path uh, where things can get back to being a little easier. No, I think the efforts that you're making and there's others uh, in the industry that are definitely at the forefront of that fight. You know, it, it is for the, the the health of the industry. It's, it's for the, the consumers. It, it's just for, for every aspect of it. That uh, When I said, then you should, I guess you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it is a, it's a hope. I mean, there, someone's got to do it. Um, it's just a, it's a big plate in the air when you're trying to do everything else to 
to uh, bring new blends and the consistency and obviously the, the, everything else you mentioned in your your um, what do you call that? Just your job duties, I guess, really. I mean, it's just yeah. something that you got, you got so many hours in the day. So if you're spending more time trying to make sure that the rest of the business can can stay afloat and be active, I mean, that probably is your number one priority, unfortunately. But, and listen, you had you had Rocky on recently. Yeah, we I mean, had Rocky on a couple of weeks ago. Rocky, yeah. Rocky has basically made it his full time job. Yes, um, doing that work and God bless him for doing it. Jeff Borshowitz of Corona also has been profoundly um, uh, engaged in that fight. Um, the CRA, of course. So you know, you have so many people. Some are obviously more public and in front and and fighting the fight. Others a little more behind the scenes, but. You know, I think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone whose whose life is not different today as a result of this regulation and trying to work through it. Then oh, you absolutely. had this. Then you had this COVID shit on top, and whew, yeah, everyone keeps asking. It's it's interesting. You don't you don't hear as much about the uh, the, the FDA stuff when it comes to cigars the last uh, few months by any means, other than a couple little articles here and there popping up on the uh, industry specific uh, blogs and websites. But uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's interesting this this time around, and we do have questions every week. That you know, this last few months here, and, and I'll I'll see if I can find one of them on this uh, this stream here. But someone did actually ask about how how everything's affecting uh, your guys' business overall with COVID nineteen. Well, so we have two arms of the business. Our retail store has been closed now, going on almost nine weeks. Mm -hmm. um, it is in the heart of Manhattan. So, um, you know, it doesn't doesn't take a lot of research to know that New York City has been affected um, to degrees greater than some countries. Mm -hmm. um, so New York City has been on lockdown. We actually we voluntarily shut down a week prior to it being mandated. Um, the governor had come out and asked uh, for non-essential businesses to basically elect to close to help sure. um, reduce um, you know, population density. So we did that a week before we were mandated to do so. Um, but so there's really, there's nothing happening at the, in our retail side, other than, um, we are taking care of some customers, um, through our wholesale side of the business and being able to get them some product. Um, we don't have a, um, a robust e-com business by any means. Right. Um, so to whatever extent we can help some of our regular customers get them products, we are. Um, um, but really, our success story is on the retail side, the fact that all of our people are healthy and all of our people are employed. Sure. So I, I couldn't be prouder of that. On the wholesale side, um, um we are all working remotely from home. Everyone has been off the road now for eight weeks. Um, but, you know, our, our business, thank God, re remains strong. I think you see, um, you know, a lot of vigilance in, in, in the industry of people trying to figure out how to keep their businesses going, whether it's curbside pickup or uh, grab and go or, uh, you know, virtual events like this that so many folks are doing. Sure. You know, it's, it's changing the landscape a bit. Um, but you know, from a pure dollars and cents standpoint, um, you know, we're, we're doing, we're doing really, really well. Oh, there's my little girl. Good night, sweets. Special guest shout out there. Love it. Yeah. I mean, with the factories, I mean, just to build off while we're talking about it, the factories you work with are, uh, uh primarily, if I'm not mistaken, Quesada as well as, uh, Placencia. Is that correct? It, it's Quesada, Placencia and Davidoff in Honduras, mm -hmm. which was formerly, um, the Aero family. Yeah. Uh, but now Davidoff owns it. So those mm -hmm. three. Yeah. And, and those, those three major company or countries rather, th those are, uh, I know I've heard that they are opening back up to kind of like, uh, some of the areas of the United States that we're, we're getting some of that. Yeah, so everyone is kind of coming back um, slowly. Certain pieces of the business, um, you know, it's a it's an uphill climb for everyone. Um, it sounds like um, everyone is open at this point. Pieces and everyone's trying to do social distancing. Um, you know, a lot of those countries seem to be less affected, um, but that's obviously it's challenging to quantify. Um, cause there isn't a, a tremendous amount of testing either being done in those places. Although, um, a lot of studies 
tend to show that um, warmer climates were less affected than right. than the than the cooler ones. So, you know, just from a uh, reasonability standpoint, I guess one could conclude that it's possible. Um, but you know, what what I do know is when you talk to factory owners, um, I don't care what factory it is, what brand it is. I've never met a factory owner who has taken their people for granted. Yeah. Um, the only way they can continue to sell the, the cigars they're selling and the volumes they do with the quality they do um, is because of the people they have. And there isn't a factory owner I know, big company, small company, Nicaragua, Honduras, Dominican, Costa Rica. Um, there isn't a single factory that I can think of that that doesn't just value their people. And so, you know, I I think everyone gets discouraged um, when you have to stop. No one is discouraged um, at the decision. People are discouraged at the situation. Sure. So, you know, it's a bummer closing our store. It's a bummer, you know, being off the road. Um, that's a, that's, it's just a drag, but nobody would argue with the decision. The decision is, is crystal clear and it's the right thing to do. And, you know, when it's healthy to do it and resume business and we can do it safely, obviously differently than we did before people are doing it. So I think you're starting to see that in the factories now, bringing back what they're identifying as essential workers to start mm -hmm. getting those gears turning again. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of facts, a lot of factories had products completed in aging. Um, so those products are the first to get banded, get packed, get sorted, um, and get out the door. And so you can leave the, the rollers home a little, then there is tobacco that is already ready. Um, but hasn't been, hasn't been assembled yet. Mm -hmm. So then that's the next wave of people you can start to bring in. You bring in some of those key rollers to start manufacturing, so I think, you know, you're starting to see it phase in. Yeah. I, I mean, I can agree with that, you know, to a point. I mean, it's it's one of those things. It's like, no, it's not, it's not even, I, I think whether or not you agree with the decision, obviously it's, it's the fact that you have to roll with it. And then, you know, if, if you've got to wait until people are more sure that, you know, all of this, I mean, day to day, you listen, you read five different news stories from yesterday and you read five different news stories today. And there's a lot of changes. It feels like there's a lot of that has changed over the last three months. And, you know, closing the businesses down. I think everyone's anxious to get back to work for the most part. I think everyone, you know, in, in, in those three countries in the United States, all over the world, they want to get back to work. It's just a matter of, are they given the green light to make sure that there is no big effect? And and I think time will tell, the facts will tell, obviously, as we get forward. But, you know, it's good to hear, though, that they, I, I mean, everything I know about this industry, it's very, very much uh, uh, family oriented. And uh, there's a lot of care that goes into the employees. And that goes from, obviously, the factory side of things, the retail side of things, uh, the manufacturer side of things. I mean, this is how this this industry has lasted as long as it has. And Nat Sherman, I think, is one of those companies. You say ninety years, and it was a family-owned business for 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 a very very long time. For eighty-seven of them. Yeah. And and I'll tell you what, uh, and it it makes me very proud to say it that when when you talk to our re our retail partners, when you talk to manufacturing partners, um, and I would argue even our staff to a large degree. Being part of that family business um, was a pretty special thing. It really, really was. It's hard to beat um, family businesses, particularly in this industry. It, it feels great. Um, however, I think with the exception of the way it feels for me as an employee, um, it shouldn't feel any different. And I, I, I give a lot of credit to, to Altria for allowing us to continue to operate the way we operated. Um, we work with the partners we've worked with. We've made the same um, types of decisions we would have made prior. Um, and so very little has changed, um, except for obviously the, the sort of corporate structure and entity of the company. Um, but, you know, largely we are we are very much the, the, the same company as we have been for 90 years. Yeah. For those that don't know the, 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 the brief history here is that uh, Nat Sherman was family owned. You said 87 years, correct? That's right. So uh, up until about three years ago, and then um, they, they got acquired by a, a major company in the, the industry, um, not necessarily the, the cigar side of it, but this was a, a premium cigar 
uh, acquisition for them. And, and I mean, you got to admit that, that I think I, I like their play as far as when it did happen. There were a couple things that we saw across the industry. But it's, it's good to hear that it would be, I think, it, it would be a poor move by someone to come in and be like, all right, you guys have been around for 87 years. We got to switch everything up. There'd be yeah, no, and it's also, no it's it's as long as you're, we're, we're that far into the history. So 2017, Altria acquired us. Yeah. The largest, uh, I believe it's the largest tobacco company in the United States of America. Um, they certainly did not buy us for our cigar business. We are sure. the smallest slice of the smallest slice of the smallest slice of the smallest slice. <laughs> um, uh, so they they bought us for our cigarette business, uh, of course, but we came along with them. And so I think they recognized um, they are cigarette experts, not premium cigar experts, and allowed yeah. us to to do what we do. That said, it was recently announced um, that Altria um, is exploring the opportunity to um, to sell the premium cigar business, which would be basically my side. So the retail store and the wholesale business. Um, and so that process is ongoing. As you can imagine, um, uh, with everything happening around the world, um, anyone capable of buying the business is also triaging their own situation. Sure. Um, but I will, I, I'm happy to share that, that the process is ongoing. And, uh, so I'm, I'm very optimistic that, um, our, our time without trio was obviously valuable, but that we have, certainly a long and bright future um, in this next phase once we depart Altria's ownership and move into new ownership. No, I simply look at it from the outside looking in. I, I see it as a, a positive transition. I think this was a necessary step possibly in the, the big picture, but would, would possibly even give uh, even further identity to the, the Nat Sherman cigar side of things. Kylie's got a visitor up there as well. You got to love about these live feeds here. Great, Kylie. Kylie, let's uh, let's take a moment here because uh, I, yeah. I did advertise that we're gonna put together a uh, I'm gonna call it a, a butchered Sazerac here. A butchered so, Sazerac, yeah. A Sazerac. So, uh, what do you what do you want me to do? You want me to tell you instructions on how Walk you're supposed to do it? I'm a gonna... terrible bartender. I can make a, a whiskey neat pretty well. You drink whiskey neat, yeah. I can uh, I can pour a beer pretty well. Um, I can do real a, good like. I can do a martini. Uh, that's 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 getting to the extent of it. Jack and Coke, okay. I, I'm I'm pretty decent at. <laughs> Back in Red Bull uh, for our guests. But, so uh, um, so for a Sazerac, a Sazerac. Somebody was asking about my last name earlier and about uh, if I'm from South LA, which seems wrong. Is that a thing? Are there a lot of Louisiana. French people in South LA? Oh, Louisiana abbreviation. Okay. I was yeah. like, South LA. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Have you been to South Louisiana LA? makes a little bit more sense there. It makes a lot more sense. I was so confused. Um, but yeah, so my last name is French. Um, so Sazerac is considered the first American cocktail, which yeah. is kind of interesting. So before your Manhattans or your um, Old Fashions or what was your, oh, the Boulevard 8. That one's not an American one, I don't think, Michael. It doesn't sound like it is. No. Um, but yeah, so it was the first original American. How about cocktail. Boulevardier? Boulevardier. That sounds, that sounds American. That does that sound sounds American. Louisiana. Absolutely. Sounds American. So um, one of the key ingredients, which Steve couldn't find, is I, right. absinthe. No, I, I'm sure I could have found it. It's I. I was I, trying to cover for you, dude. Ah, that's too late. I, I don't need I don't need cover. I just I don't see much purpose for it in my 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 home, so I didn't want to buy a bottle just for for this one. I'm probably gonna regret it. And I'm gonna buy it this but week. You could probably substitute like a a whisper of some other anise Sambuca. flavor. Yeah, or I mean, like a real whisper of it. What do I? You know what? I'm gonna shut up. I'm not the bartender. <laughs> Go ahead. Just drink your drink, Michael. <laughs> that's what a bartender would tell you. <laughs> So, all right. So I don't have the absent. This was a rinse, you said. Yeah. So it's called a wash. A wash. So yeah. So it's really just like a quarter of an ounce of absinthe. And what you do is you take it and you roll it around the glass and you literally roll it out of the glass into the sink or yeah. drink it. You can do that too. Um, but they made official absinthe illegal. I think it was 1912, maybe. A few years back. A couple of years. Michael, you were there. Um, so they made it illegal because of the, uh, hallucinogenic properties that it had. Right. So 
anything that you buy now is not going to make you hallucinate, which we talk about this idea about bourbon being from Bourbon County, but that's not actually the case. An absinthe that you buy today is not going to actually be the absinthe that you would have had pre-1912. Yeah. Um, So they called it the green fairy because if you've seen absinthe before, it's a bright, bright green color. And then they also called it the black death because it tastes like black licorice. That's a intimidating name, Black Death. Yeah, which is appropriate for right now, isn't it? Sure, sure. All right, so (laughs) normally you do a you do a a wash, correct? An absinthe wash, yeah, and let it roll out of the glass. Let's pretend for especially our audio uh, listeners. (laughs) I just did that, right? Like I said, this is uh this is we're doing the best we can, but I like the idea. This is the first time out of a now 118 episodes that we're doing an actual cocktail on the show. So we're doing our best. This is what we've been waiting for. Yes. So what, what's, what's, what's after the, uh, the, the wash? So what you're going to do is, uh, d- does your recipe say sh- a sugar cube? I have a, 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 one of them says a sugar cube and the other says a teaspoon of sugar. Okay. So I prefer a sugar cube because the Pechard's bitters, the guy who invented the Sazerac, his name Pechard, uh, the Pechard bitters, you'll actually sprinkle about three, four drops onto the sugar cube and you'll muddle it. Yeah. I have seen so that. that creates a whole new kind of chemical reaction between the sugar and the bitters, and it kind of works together. Are you pretending? Are you doing it? Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, this is the, the sugar cube more in a, uh, a, a bowl type of a shape. Okay. Oh, <laughs> a measuring spoon? Just stop, all right? Okay, sorry. All right, go on, go on. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Act like everyone, like no one's actually watching. Everyone's actually listening on audio. So I'm putting the, put the sugar cube. Yes, the sugar, the sugar cube in the bottom. Ish in the bottom, yeah. All right, and sugar cube s- has been dropped in there in a scoop form. And then a few dashes of bitters. Okay. What kind of bitters do you have, Steve? I I am not good at pronouncing this. It says uh, it's aromatic bitters, but the uh, Angostura. Store? Angostura, yeah. That's it. That's what I said. Which is one of the higher selling bitters that are on the market i've always liked the woodford cherry wood but but they make yeah. all sorts of different kinds they make like a spicy mole one there's lavender bitters there's any kind of bitters you could ever imagine it exists all right so i got bitters a couple of dashes on your sugar cube all right three dashes and now you're going to muddle your sugar cube Look like much <laughs> with your with your bitters. So here's my. I've had, uh, I've had three bourbons since we started making this cocktail. <laughs> the second part will be great for you then. It's in slow motion. Hey, you're giving history here. I'm. I mean, what do you want me to do? All right. So uh, yeah, muddled. Muddled. Okay. <laughs> Stirred. Go on. Uh, and then you're gonna add uh, about an ounce and a half of your favorite whiskey. Or your rye whiskey. I've got Michter's straight rye. It's the uh, only rye that I perfect. didn't want to uh, save right now. It's perfect. Ounce and a half. That seems about right. Perfect measurement. I can hear it. Yeah. And? And then you would usually stir it and strain it onto another set of ice. I feel like we should have done a, a, a trial run here. No. It's okay. We're doing all right. Yeah. I've all seen right. worse cocktails than poor like, being made. <laughs> you ever had a chocolate martini? <laughs> Throw out poor bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> Are we supposed to do ice? Are we supposed to do... I saw there was like some water in this thing. Uh, if you're doing ice and you're stirring it, that's basically your water. So, I feel like basically at this point, I've got... I've got, I've got rye whiskey with some sugar and bitters in it. Is uh, what I've yeah, and so absent. I don't think I am going to be applying for any bartending jobs anytime well, soon. Well, and the key to this is to get your lemon peel, Yay. to twist so it opens it up and right. rub it around the rim. All right, of the next glass time, and give Kyle, it a you're in town, you're interest. making me a Sazerac. All right, you got it, boss man. Right. Making me one too. Yeah. <laughs> we'll send exactly. it over, Michael. <laughs> See, Michael, if if this if everything was normal and you were in the area, we would have done this in the garage, and it would have been amazing because it would have been like a QBC or like a, a a news segment where we have Kylie actually mixing us, educating us on how to make this, and then you and I just sit there and we get to try yeah, it. Smoke. I'm a professional, so yeah, we'll we'll set that up for next time. All well, right. if you will, if you will promise me a rain check, that'd be amazing. That'd be absolutely amazing. We'll do it. 
Smells good. Smells like whiskey. <laughs> There's nothing in it, man. Oh, you basically good. made Kylie, that is really whiskey. good. Kylie, oh, man, I'm is... so good at making drinks. My gosh, Kylie, that is phenomenal. <laughs> You're a good student. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. So, I, Michael, we said before, because everyone's interested in the, 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 the whiskey side as well, you are sipping on, you said, uh, Knob Creek, correct? Yeah, Knob Creek. Is that a go-to for you? You know... I am one of these guys. Um, the idea of go to is very difficult for me. Okay. Um, I really, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say that. Go to um, is easy for me, but it's not just one or two. Um, and I'm also one of those guys, I don't know if you're the same, but if, if you get down to like a fourth of your bottle, I never want to finish it. And then I get something else. And then so I end up having like all these like quarter bottles of random stuff around. Because right. I want to be able to go back to it. Um, so I, I like Knob Creek a lot, um, both the bourbon and the rye. Um, I like um, I like Elijah Craig a lot yeah. uh, for, for just go-to bourbon. Um, you know, in general, I'm not a big um, – I'm not a big trophy guy. Um, I, I don't necessarily – while I – certainly would never say no to a trophy, a pappy or whatever. Sure. Um, I find more um, pleasure and fulfillment out of finding value. Now, even if that value is expensive, but the experience delivered meets or exceeds my expectations of that price. Yeah. For me, that's, that is everything for me. And that's, that's whether I'm talking about wine, cigars, um, clothing, food. For me, that's it's. I don't mind. I don't mind spending the money, but there has to be equity to support the price. That is not just brand and marketing. Well, it you, has to be an experience. You mentioned it a little bit earlier, talking about Nat Sherman. I mean, it's a, there's an experience there. I feel like you know, there's there's got to be value in the experience when you're doing it. I mean. I, get that question a lot when we're, we're doing different bourbons on here, different cigars. And, you know, and every day people are asking, you know, like, Hey, this cigar is, you know, $45. This cigar is, uh, you know, $80. Is it worth it? And I always say I'm the, I'm the wrong guy to ask because it, it's, it's absolutely up to you. I mean, if I, that's right. Yeah. I, I probably wouldn't be the first thing I grab. Same thing with whiskeys. You know, it's uh you're talking about not finishing bottles. I don't feel guilty necessarily finishing a bottle of Knob Creek because I know I can go down the street. If I wanted to go get another one, I can go do that. It's the other bottles that I know. But I also have a very, I have a very ADD palate. Okay. And that's not, that's not to be um, critical of those with ADD. Um, But it's, you know, I, I jump around so much, you know, I think I'm in the mood for bourbon and then I'll go and grab a bourbon, but then I don't want the bourbon. And then I feel like, you know, what I really was in the mood for was a single malt. And yeah. then I might have a taste of that, and it's like, ah, I wasn't in the mood for that. I actually want rum, or you know, I, I. So the idea of go to is is painfully difficult for me because I, it's it's really got to be like the right thing, time and place, and then grab that. Well, um, but so having having strong go tos that I know are going to be consistent and the same for me. Knob is one. Elijah Craig is one. Um, we did a lot of work with um, Widow Jane. Back yeah. in the day, and and um, based out of New York, right? Yeah, their products were great. It's been a while since I've had it, but um, we did a lot of pairings with them. Um, Willet, I think, is extraordinary. Jefferson, Jefferson Ocean, mm-hmm. um, you know, specifically bourbon. Like those are some of my uh, br- regular Buffalo Trace. I think is great. Um, you know. Buffalo Trace products are always a favorite for 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 me. Uh, Will it love it? Ohio, by the way, you can't get Will it products. They don't distribute to Ohio. It's really? One of the states? Yeah, yeah. That's just not like fair. C- well, just like cigars, Ohio is a little different the way that they they bring stuff in. So uh, in o- in Ohio, you've got a state run liquor agency, and there's something about the the there's no agreement there for them to do that. So. You know, it's unfortunate, but a lot of people just kind of go just south or, or to Indiana or, or wherever and they pick up some Willet products and, and definitely some of the more fantastic ones. But, you know, for me, I get that. I mean, I, I will recommend if you have a bottle of Michter's straight rye, some bitters, some sugar. Um, 
and some ice. No cream. absinthe. That might. You buy. If you got those, what did I have? Four ingredients and maybe some ice. I love Mickridge. Might be it's your so uh, new go-to. This is a I good talk, Joe Kali. Thank you. You're welcome. Glad I could help. Sort of. <laughs> if I had gotten the memo in advance, I would have had the ingredients and pre-made. Whose fault but... was that? <laughs> <laughs> Who could that have been? I know whose fault it wasn't. <laughs> Well, I enjoy but this. Who cares? Show. We're drinking um, and smoking and having a great time. I sent yeah. you a message on MySpace. You didn't get it? Oh, yeah. Very good. Tom, Tom intercepted I it. I was going to say I was busy talking to Tom. <laughs> Have you tried this, Michael? The old granddad no. 14. No. OGD. No. OGD. This just hit the market in Ohio recently. It's a $30 bottle. I'm uh, kind of sipping on that on the side. I'm not going to say a whole lot about it because I think we're going to review it on a on a future podcast. But it's definitely for... Uh, twenty nine ninety nine. It's uh, it's it's drinking pretty well. A lot of people are enjoying it, so it's definitely something I would recommend. Jake's being a butthole. Jake, Jerry's Jake. sipping on a little Elijah Craig right now. He said that's good. Yeah, we got uh, Richard Payton out there. Said Widow Jane is one of his new faves. Richard, yeah, calm good. down. It's good stuff. Jake Sanders says, "Why is Kylie dressed up?" We're not Sherman. Because it's, it's not midnight on a Wednesday yet. <laughs> You're not sitting at home <laughs> <laughs> on a late call. I gotta um, tell you, I almost, I almost got dressed up for this tonight because it's, it has been <laughs> just to do it. It has been nine and a half weeks since I've worn a suit, which officially is the longest ever. Let me tell you, Michael, you are, uh, in all intents and purposes of this show, you are uh, fairly dressed up. You're, you're dressed further up than uh, a lot of our guests on I'll our take it. Basis. So yeah, you're doing just fine. You're doing just fine. Hey, can you tell me is my, is my video and audio okay? Yeah, you're so good on our end. On my side, okay, good. Well, so let's do this. Uh, as we, we roll through this uh, this part one here, typically we do a, a, a rated out of 10. You guys did the 10 as far as strength. And since we're not drinking the same things, I'm going to give a 10 out of 10 on that cocktail for the for, for start. It's uh, fantastic. But um, I, I do like uh, doing this, especially with people that are, are from the company. When you, you talk about this, for, for everyone listening, the, the, the Nat Sherman Timeless Supreme, if you had to rate it out of 10 – with all things considered, where would you put this? We'll start with uh, Kylie. Just overall? Overall. However you want to rate it. 10 being the best. I'm going to give it like, I'm going to probably give it a 9 because I smoke this a lot. Like it's my, my Friday, I've worked 60 hours. I've got, I'm on a six hour drive home. And I need something to just finish off my last hour. I smoke it a lot. I, we, we were laughing a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about me going to Whole Foods and setting my cigar and my tire when I went in to get the salad bar. <laughs> and this is definitely one of them that hits the tire and I come out and it's still it's a tire cigar. So, yeah, By the way, cigar. it's box press. So it actually hangs out on the tire pretty well. It really does. Some of those if you guys are looking to, right uh, you know, amp up the, uh, the promo on this cigar, like on the website, that could be part of it. You know, it's a good tire cigar. Free set of tires with every box. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa! That's hey, whoa, no, just kidding. Just nah, kidding. Nah, 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 nah. No. All right, Michael, how about you with this? Uh, the Nat Sherman Timeless Supreme. Where would you rank this? Uh, one out of ten, with all uh, all factors in, involved. Uh, I would share the nine. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anything is perfect, and I don't think that um, we could be happy. So the only way I would give it a ten is if this was an 11 point scale, oh, um, fair. So I will give it a nine, but I also give it a nine. I have a different, I have a different context to frame the rating around. And that is what did we set out to achieve? Mm -hmm. Did we do it? And have we maintained it? Um, so what we set out to achieve was a, um, well-balanced Nicaraguan Puro to play in new world sizes hedging old world flavor um and i think we did that successfully in 2012 so i would have given myself a nine then and with obviously the uh the placentius then i would ask myself how have we done since then and this cigar has rated consistently well every year whether it's cigar aficionado or other places it continues to to maintain position and grow market share year after year. Um, and here we are 
you know, we launched this product in 2012, it's 2020. So we're almost at the eight year mark when this product was released. Um, and we're talking about it like it's new. And to me, that's, that is the mark of a great, great collection of premium cigars. So many times people want to talk about what's new, what's new, what's new, what's new. Well, what's new does not mean what's new to the market. What's new means what's new in your humidor and what's new in your hand. Correct. And, and you know, you put this cigar in anyone's hand. I think it delivers on all counts. You have graceful strength. You have um, phenomenal flavor. Everything you would want from Nicaragua. And more because you can taste it without yeah. being clobbered by feeling. Um, you know, ferocity, strength, nicotine, all that stuff. You don't get those feelings with this cigar. And so you're able to really taste the best of Nicaragua without having to deal with the effects of its strongest tobaccos. Um, and the fact that we've done it consistently every year, it's a nine. Well, I think it's interesting you bring up the uh, the, the publications like Aficionado. I think, in the, I mean, we see new publications coming out over the last five, ten years. And, I mean, that, that's part of it. Uh, you you kind of – I take everything you said as far as talking like it's still new. It's it's being relevant after so many years with a particular – That's a great word. Uh, I mean, and yeah, it's just because it's easy to, to fall in the mix as like, yeah, that – yeah, I used to smoke that, but it's, you know, it's it, it's good cigar. But people keep coming back to certain blends. And I think this yeah, but is listen, you you just brought up something important. Lots of people say, I used to smoke that. And it's one of my favorite experiments to do. Personally, I'll go downstairs if I'm working in the townhouse and I'll think of a cigar that I used to enjoy a lot. Um, and I'll pick it up. Yeah. Very rarely does it deliver what it used to. And so consumers often confuse that with the fact that their taste or their palate have changed. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Well, that's absolutely false. Of course, their palate has changed for the better. Our palates become better and better and better. They're machines. They're, they're constantly learning and retaining knowledge. Our palate has its own brain and sense of memory. And so you're able to remember those things on your palate and in your nose. And so when you smoke one of those nostalgic snapshot cigars of your own um, cigar smoking um, infancy, mm -hmm. when I smoke Metropolitan, for example, it reminds me so much of the cigars I smoked in the 90s. That, by the way, were not Metropolitan. I didn't smoke a lot of Nat Sherman at that time in Boston. They're, they were very hard to find at that time. But it reminds me of the spirit of those cigars. But when I go back and smoke the actual cigar I smoked back then, it's different. Yeah, It could be grassier. It could be leaner. It doesn't have the same, um, it doesn't have the same delivery of perfection the way I think ours does. Um, and so, you know, find me another company that is 90 years old with as curated a collection of premium cigars as ours for the for for the uh, the time that we've been in market you know we've discontinued more than we've launched is that right and that is for the sole purposes of making sure that we are honoring our responsibility as a legacy premium cigar brand american cigar brand yeah and and that means that whether it's metropolitan in all of its iterations, whether it's the Timeless Collection, which was sort of the, the 2.0 relaunch for what we do, um, Epica, which was throwback but new, you know, these are these are blends and products and, and brands that have stood the test of time and will certainly continue to do so. No, absolutely. And I, I mean you're you're summarizing it just perfectly, which is which is fantastic. I mean I was going to say, based on all of the things you've said, but with this cigar, and, and for a lot of the same reasons, I would 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 be right there with a nine because the way I, I word this is that in a similar way, but maybe a little more brief because I uh, maybe don't have the 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 use of the words that you have when you're describing the blends that you're so familiar with. Um, 
it, it, this cigar is exactly what it's intended for. And that's what I, I think when you look at the price point of this cigar, you look at um, the, the way it smokes, you look at this is a, a Nicar Nicaraguan cigar. I agree with everything you're saying, Michael and, and, and Kylie as well. I mean, this is a, a cigar that when you, you, you smoke this, you know what you're getting once you get into cigars to a certain level. As you're, you're getting into it, you're familiarizing yourself with smoking cigars, this might be intimidating. We mentioned that before, but with this uh, Supreme, no matter what band's on it, I think that's the whole thing. It's relevant. It's what it's intended to be. It, it smokes beautifully. It's not trying to be something it's not, which I think a lot of times you'll see in, in both the, the whiskey. You mentioned wine. You, you mentioned fashion. There's so many different worlds that people try to to be something they're not with that product, and this is not one of those. And uh, the fact that it's still relevant. And I, I got to tell you, it's it's interesting, at least. And I'm sure it is different around the world, around the country. But this is one that has been out for eight years. But I have plenty of customers that come in that this is still new to them. And uh, it's not just because of the change in the, in the bands or the boxes or anything else. This is just something that with an expansive brand like Nat Sherman, this I, I feel is is still somehow not what you're known for to the general consumer. But when they smoke it, they they realize it's the, the same quality of product. And it's something like, again, it's intended for 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 a different purpose as part of the portfolio. What's what I think is incredible is we are still after 90 years, a brand that is being discovered. And I think that's incredible. Um, so the idea of what's new, uh, I had this conversation years ago. We were talking about some of the old school products that we used to smoke in the 90s mm -hmm. which if you if you talk to the old timers in our industry they would say that you know even the 90s is not old that's new sure um but if you haven't smoked and i never talk about um competitors and peers but i will for the purposes of this <laughs> if you've if you've never smoked a regular hoya de monterey mm -hmm. Honduran or a Excalibur. regular, um, regular, I would say a Rothschild. Okay. And you've never smoked a punch Rothschild. Um, if you've never smoked a regular Partagas, um, red label 18, whatever it's called, I forget. Um, yeah, I know you're talking about, uh, yeah, the, 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 um, you know, which was Cameroon at the time mm -hmm. that I smoked it. Mm -hmm. Um, Without tasting those, you can't understand why we are where we are today as an industry. Because like wine, whiskey, food, uh, cigars, menswear, if you see something and say, that is great, I'm going to do that too, you're already behind and you're never going to do it better. It's a very good point. If you think about, and I'll use Pete Johnson because he's one of my best friends in this business, um, and Pete and I talk a lot about this. So, so for those who don't know, Pete Johnson is, uh, the founder of Tatuaje Cigars. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Havana Cellars, Tatuaje Cigars. Mm -hmm. Pete, the reason he came out with the products he came out with was not to taste like the products he liked. It was because he was so inspired by the products he liked. He wanted to find a new chapter. Mm -hmm. a new experience and that's what really establishes great brands and products is when you are inspired and give credit to those that came before and then you take that and channel it and do something better that's where you win yeah. so to me you know if we go back to the timeless supreme it would have been easy to launch timeless supreme as a nicaraguan puro face melter i mean that would have been a piece of cake but we didn't do it because by the time we did it everyone was already going that direction so we knew that we would have been one of but i can assure you we were probably one of the only nicaraguan puro large ring gauge no lijero mm -hmm. blends that launched oh for sure that's where you're inspired by what happens first, and then you see an opportunity to take that, channel it, and perfect it. Not to replace it, not to compete with, but to say, if you like this, then let me carry that journey on for you and experience something different. 
And that's what we have always done as, okay. a, as, a, as a company. Well, I was going to say, it's funny you bring that back up, you know, about as a company. I was about to say, that's the, that's the long play. That, that's the long play there is that you're, you're, you're building off a trend possibly, and then you put your own spin on it with a different direction, but it's still going in the, the same general direction. And that's, I think, the long play. It's not just trying to, to move a product, a cigar in this, this case, just to, to get on the same page as someone that already has, and you're just trying to steal market share. So what I would say is how, how we play the trend is on the backside of that wave. So as people buy into a trend, looking at what those companies or brands did well and assuming that they could be abandoning the commitment to that experience to move in the direction of the wave. Yeah. Um, the best example of that is Sterling. People, Sterling for me is is probably it is the blend I am the most proud of. Yeah. As an ongoing blend, and I'm proud of all of all the stuff that we do, but Sterling because we launched that in 2013, I think 2014, when again Nicaraguan full body trend was now a hundred percent. Everybody was trying to to get a piece of that full pie. Ahead. Full steam ahead at that point. What was abandoned was elegance and grace and sophistication. Um, the idea that you can have full-bodied mouthfeel in a mild and elegant flavor was being abandoned by people chasing this full-bodied, in-your-face um, thing. And so we jumped in, and when we released Sterling, we released it in a 4 by 40 a five by 42, six by 43, and five and three quarters by 46. That is a long play if I ever saw one in the cigar so industry. Probably the four worst sizes to try and sell in 2014. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Not to mention it was a Connecticut Ecuador wrapper in a fully Dominican blend with no Lajero. Um, it was the complete opposite. And I had a lunch with retailers. Um, as we were, we had this sort of retail advisory group starting with timeless and I got everyone together at lunch at Emerald's restaurant in, um, in Las Vegas. And, uh, I said, you know, these are the two things we're releasing 1930 and Sterling 1930 plays into everything that is popular. Sterling runs in the opposite direction, but it is our obligation as America's tobacconist and tobacconists to the world to make sure that that experience is represented in the best way possible. So do me a favor and don't buy it because they're small, they're expensive, they're complex. And if they're not going to resonate with your audience, don't do it. But we have to do it because the industry needs it to be there. We sold out our entire first production by day two of that trade show. And Sterling remains not our best seller, but I think it remains among our most respected blends just because of the role it plays. And when you smoke Sterling, man, it, it is, you know, people say, I like red wine. I don't like white. Mm -hmm. It's because you haven't had the right white. Sure. And it's the same here. You know, I don't like mild cigars. You, that's not true. And this isn't a mild cigar. You're assuming it is because it's made in Dominican or it's got a light wrapper. But this cigar has the body that would compete against the strongest cigar in your humidor today. The mouthfeel and body and weight of smoke is heavier and denser than Lajero bombs. Yeah. But we're able to deliver it in a way that is creamy and sophisticated and elegant. Um, and that is very difficult to do, to balance those two things. The fact that we did it as well as we did with the Casada family, I think is is probably one of the greatest achievements of my career at Net Sherman. Well, and, and Michael, I got to tell you, when you talk about, uh, you know, joining trends and everything else, it was an interesting time when you bring that up. You said it was 2013, 2014, right? Yeah. Yeah. And about 2017, if you remember at the trade show, I think it was 2017 maybe 2016, one of those years, there were a 
more than a handful of Connecticut shade wrapped cigars blowing up at all these somewhat newer companies, some of these other that were originally trying to get into the market where everyone was going the heavier side. And then they're like, wait a second, some of the tried and true, you know, cigars that are still selling like crazy. Some of the biggest skews out there as far as the blends are some of the more medium Connecticut shade, but have a lot of flavor, have a lot of body, all that stuff. So and, specifically uh, companies who we didn't want to get in the way in way of yeah. um, following the full body train. The year after Sterling, people released Connecticut versions of a lot of things. Oh, yeah. well, here's what I'll say about that. And this is not to, to talk negatively about any of my peers, because I would never do that. Certainly not. What I think is important is to understand if every company is in growth mode, how do you diversify your portfolio? So when you come out of the gate trying to differentiate, um, and one of the one of the companies I admire the most is my father. Mm -hmm. So look at what my father did. They came out of the gate really leading with a lot of what Pete did. And led the charge in a body of Nicaraguan experience that was quite different than the Nicaraguan puros that were typical of the cigar boom, really hedging some strength and complexity and richness, et cetera. Um, if you look at what they were up against, they were up against the typical American market, um, medium, medium plus cigars, mm -hmm. uh, Honduras at the time was probably the strongest on the American market with some participation, obviously, from the Dominican Republic. Um, but my father really helped carve out a piece of Nicaragua that led with with um, forward flavor. I don't want to say strength, but forward flavor um, that helped open up doors. But how can they then continue to grow their business when they pioneered? that movement and now everyone is eating a piece of their pie the only thing they can do is fill in the blanks oh yeah of what's left so you know it's it's no surprise that that this this whole thing is cyclical oh, absolutely. right and it, it just depends it depends what point you jump on the ride as far as what you bring to market and then what you diversify with but you know round and round and round we go that is our industry well, and it's tough when you're known for something, then you have to be try you have to try to either educate your your consumer base, your your fan base, and you say, Hey, this is something else. By the way, like I liked your point by the with the if you don't think you'll like this, don't buy it. You know, keep buying what you think your customers are gonna like. Same thing with the consumer. Hey, you know, my father, you and Nat Sherman, we're coming out with this this Nicaraguan. Yeah, it's the trend, but if you're a Nat Sherman smoker, chances are you may not like it based on what you like from our portfolio. But, but what, what I do something. appreciate is it's all about blending the margins. That's right. And um, where someone may not have picked up a natural and metropolitan before because they were convinced they didn't like Connecticut. They were introduced to Connecticut by the great folks at my father or Oliva or any of sure. those companies sure. who were driving richness Nicaraguan um they were driving the Nicaraguan market really and then soften those mm -hmm. with a Connecticut expression and in so doing opens up a new world to what Connecticut offers or yeah. Connecticut Ecuador and then you know so goes the exploration and so you start looking around well what else has Ecuador and what else has Connecticut exactly and before right. you know it you're going to end up at Metropolitan now you're going to pick that up and it's going to be new for you that's right. We've made Metropolitan Connecticut since 1994. Not quite new. Not new, <laughs> but new for you. So that goes back to where we started this, which is for me, our, our goal is not to come out with new, 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 new. Our goal is to make sure that we preserve yeah. the products we make perfectly so that whatever time you are, you are either introduced to them or you reacquaint yourself with them, it is as familiar as the last time and as familiar as the first time. 
No, I like that. I think that actually leads a little bit into the topic of the night, which we'll we'll, we'll round out here uh, part one, and then we'll uh, take a, a quick break on the audio. And then I don't know if you guys need a break, but if you guys are listening on uh, the audio side of things, um, part one, we're going to end up. Make sure that you guys check out part two on the audio. And if you're watching live on Facebook or YouTube, checking out the video, stay tuned. But it is about that. I think Nat Sherman, one of the reasons I like this topic of uh, you know present your best self I think that goes hand in hand with what you're saying is that, you know, it is what you want to be known for. It's, it's, it's how you stay true to what the overall goal is day in, day out with whether it be personal, whether it be in business relationships or, or a brand, this is all about it. There's a lot of effort that goes into this type of a topic. So I do want to thank our, our sponsors for part one, Tinderbox at Easton, Altus USA, BS Cigar Company, and also the Patreon page. We appreciate all the support. And Michael and Kylie, I appreciate you guys being a part of part one. And and uh, thank you for uh, hoping to stick around for part two, everyone else out there listening. And we're going to get into that just shortly. So thank you guys very much. I'm going to raise my cocktail that Kylie guided me through. This Again, fantastic cocktail. Yeah. Fantastic. Guys, cheers on part one. Time. Thank you very much. Don't mind me. I'm just readjusting. My phone's dying. Oh, no. So, Michael, this is where we take a quick break. You guys, are you guys good? We can roll right into part two if you'd like. I'm actually just going to run in talk. for two seconds. Yeah, that's fair. I'll be right that's back. Fair. If anyone out there listening on uh, the on the, the the feed, if you guys have any questions going into to part two, you can just put them I on the post. I got a lot of questions, Steve. Yeah, what's that? No, I'm just kidding. I don't have any questions. No questions right now. Huh? We had a lot of feedback here, uh, Nate who's usually uh, in the garage on, on normal circumstances. He said, he said it before, and I'll say it again. The Sterling is not only my favorite Nat Sherman, but is my favorite mild cigar. I love the so retro ale. Michael was talking about it, and I lit one up. I was like, I had He's, to. He, yeah, he makes you want to smoke it. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. I know I drank this giant coffee, so I'm going to have to step away for a moment. All right, I'll just stay here. No, it's okay. I'll wait till Michael comes back. That's good manners right there. Does anyone out there have any questions? Go ahead. Bobby Hirschman said, where's the water? I am sipping on water a little bit more tonight. I got, I got to make sure I stay a little, little hydrated here. Try to. Try to. That's right. No, it's good. I mean, I, I enjoy hearing more about Nat Sherman. I hope everyone else out there on the video, I mean, this isn't going to be part of the audio, but I hope everyone, you know, has enjoyed this. Um, yeah. This is a brand that depending on the shop and, you know, with, with those that are familiar with uh, Tinderbox, I mean, Kylie's done a great job in, in getting different blends in, in, a, in the humidor, but uh, you know, it, it's something that it, it's interesting. You go to certain parts of the country. I'm sure you see it, Kylie too, is that a brand that has been around as long as Nat Sherman, it's, it's, it's very prevalent in a lot of humidors and then other humidors, it's, it's a tough sell. Just, I mean, there's, there's no rhyme or reason. I mean, I'm sure you can you can kind of analyze exactly why certain shops don't do well with a certain brand. But yeah. we, we've had that with Nat Sherman and a handful of others that I love their cigars. I love the tobacco. I love what they're doing. And then you put it on the shelf and you talk to people about it. And you're like, that's that was really good. What what else? What else should I try? And then you're just like, OK, and then you just keep going. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting, too, because it's like I, I always feel like there's definitely like a niche for each shop about like what their particular you know most popular sales lines are or yeah. collections sorry most popular collections are and like i just went out to california the first week of march and things are very very different there oh yeah i mean despite their tax being as high as it is they're still carrying a lot of like davidoff products like a lot but yeah. the money in california spends just differently than it does in columbus ohio it just does it spends differently so considering that like it is it's just different from shop to shop state to state one shop could do ton of lanceros and two blocks down the road they're only selling gordos so yeah. whenever i think something makes sense and i understand the market yeah. something like that happens be like oh do you have any lanceros it's like what yeah you're what like you no we don't have any lanceros because they don't sell yeah. and some shops carry 20 different facings of them that's right. So you never know. You don't. And it always changes. I mean, you're absolutely right. And it's, it's very interesting to see that. And with like Davidoff, we brought it in. Um, 
what's that been three years now and it's 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 done really well for us but again it's i think it depends on the over, like the overall atmosphere of the shop and then also with like for us at, at tinderbox it's a huge walkthrough traffic type of a place and you know when everything is normal um when i say normal before all this covid stuff you know we had a basically a fully booked hilton not too far. We got some great areas around the, the 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 shop, and so we have a lot of foot traffic. And so when it comes in, we have the Davidoff case right next to the register, and I call it the most expensive pack of gum that anyone buys yeah. because they, they've already shopped the humidor, and then they like like even if they don't know what it is, you got this shiny white box with lights in it, and they're like, "Oh, are these good?" And you're like, "Oh yeah, they are." And like, well, none of them have prices on them. You're like, "Oh, that's interesting." Well, which one do you think you'd be interested in? And you start talking to them. Well, how much is that? You're like, "Ah, oh, it's twenty three, twenty four dollars." They're like, ah, yeah, okay, let's try that. They're good, right? And yeah, they're good. There was a, I can't remember who I was sitting with. Uh, it was at Tenderbox at Easton, and the guy was like, "No, he's like this. Those cigars aren't that much." And I was like, "No, like they are." Yeah. He's like, "Oh, and what do you know?" And I was like, hey, "What do you know, Kylie?" <laughs> Nothing. Exactly. I realize every single day that I know less than I think I know. I think you're in good company there. Yeah. All right, do you want to roll into it? You concur. You know Kylie well then. No, no, I do the same thing. Oh, just in general. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a yeah, it's a familiar feeling. All right, let's roll into part two here. I'll be back. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I'll I'll do the intro here. Welcome back to the Bourbon and BS podcast. This is episode 118, part two. We are continuing the conversation. If you did not check out on the audio part one. We smoked a fantastic Nat Sherman Timeless Supreme. Smoked a couple different sizes, actually three different sizes between the three of us. Uh, but we all are on, in agreement. But check that that episode out, the uh, part one, to hear what we had to say about that. We also were sipping on some whiskeys, uh, a couple different whiskeys, as well as Kylie walked me through a fantastic cocktail that I absolutely butchered because I have very limited cocktail supplies, but I got to tell you, I enjoyed it and I'll recommend it. It'll be, uh, we'll have to come up with a different name for this cocktail, but uh, we were trying to make a Sazerac, which is one of Michael Herklotz's uh, top cocktails. So Michael, welcome back to part two here. Good to be with you, man. Absolutely. Thanks for sticking with us here. This is where we kind of go off uh, into a different direction. I do want to thank our sponsors, uh, Tinderbox at Easton, uh, also Altidus USA and BS Cigar Company. Also, there's a Patreon page, patreon.com slash bourbon and bs podcast if you guys want to contribute help this thing going it's been tremendous support and it helps us do things like this remote feed and, and get everyone together and, and have a little bit uh, a nice interface here and, and good audio and video quality so we appreciate the support this is where we go a little bit different this is part two uh michael i know you said you've been listening to a few of the podcasts more recently and um and i appreciate that but this is where the, the topic part of it comes in. So just like in your typical uh, cigar shop, you're hanging out in a garage, you're hanging on someone's patio, everyone lights up a cigar, everyone maybe sits back with a drink, everyone starts talking about what they're smoking and drinking, you know, how the day was. And then by the end of the evening, you, you get into all sorts of random topics when you run out of things to talk about. Right now, you can't really talk about sports a whole lot. You know, you, know, you can't talk about... I can't talk about sports anyway. Yeah, no. In fairness. No, no. well... No. I'm just saying like this is where it kind of like something comes up and then all of a sudden everyone gets into that conversation and everyone learns from each other. I mean, that's kind of the, the, the model of this podcast. So tonight it is uh, the topic is present your best self. And one of the reasons I, I picked this topic is, is because Nat Sherman is uh, the featured guest as far as the brand. Uh, Kylie uh, being in the industry, we've uh, been trying to get her on for, for some time, which I'm, I'm happy Kylie's been a part of this. But, you know, as a uh, on the, the road sales rep, not only in just other parts of life, you do have to walk in uh, every time, whether it be a new account, a previous account, talking to a new customer, you got to present your best self. And with Michael, I know you have a history in, in, in music. You, you, you fell into cigars almost from, from my understanding. And then along the way, you, you've mentioned towards the end of part one, uh, you know, men's fashion and, and, and just the overall quality and experience of no matter what you're into, whatever you're, you're, you're doing, whatever you're, you're buying or, or, or uh, you know, drinking, smoking, whatever it might be, there, there's always the, the experience, the quality, the value there. And I think that that goes along with um, people as, as themselves. And I think it's a constant struggle. And I think this is something that I know I've struggled with. This time has been 
very interesting with the coronavirus going around and everyone's life has been uprooted for the most part. Some in, in worse ways than others. Some people are just bored and some people have had some some, some very, very tragic things happen in, in their circles. But I think this is something that this has been a learning experience going into it and coming out of it hopefully here soon. But it's time that uh, I think that self-reflection has always been something that people have been so busy going into this this year, 2020, that uh, a lot of people lose track of, of who they, they want to be as far as getting into the business world. When you wake up in the morning, um, how you take care of yourself and, and what all goes into presenting your best self. So, um, Michael, I mean, if you could just, you know, a little bit of your background. I mean, I, I got to say your your image. So and I don't want to just stick with this, but I think a good way to to go into this is almost as a, a lead in, but also a, a contrast of the the true value of this. But when you look at, say, social media and that's where this last six weeks, especially We've seen, I've seen a lot of changes in personalities in social media because there's, 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 there's more realness to it. It's not just, you know, I, I followed you, Michael, for a while on like Instagram and such like that. One of the things I like uh, following you for is because you're a Cadillac guy. I'm a Cadillac guy, so I enjoy that. Um, but again, you're, you're, you're kind of known in the industry as not only someone that has completely immersed yourself in the cigar industry, but you have a personality, you have a presence in, in pictures and interviews and, and, and everything that, uh, that doesn't always come naturally. And I, 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 I would be willing to bet that that was not always necessarily natural for you, but something that is a consistent thing that you, you work on and brush up on and, and presenting your best self is you don't just roll out of bed like this. Uh, well, actually I rolled out of bed like this, to be honest well, with you. for the audio listeners. <clears throat> um, I did too. I definitely <laughs> did too. I think um, whether it's work and marketing, um, product development, company growth, I was always brought up in, uh, rooted in truth. Be proud of who you are. Um, be proud of your name. Be proud of where you come from. Because um, those are things that, that you, can't, you can't fake. Sure. Um, my father and my grandfather, both very proud guys, um, uh, on my mom's side too, you know, it, there was a, I just turned 40. So if you think about generationally, um, if you go back to my parents, parents generation, that was a generation that came out of the, the great depression uh, a lot of them were immigrants. Yeah. Um, if not, they were first generation for sure. Um, and so a lot of that idea of authenticity was instilled, either instilled in them by their parents or was developed in them because it was just the only way to be. That's all you um, do. Right. I think that that largely remained up until um social media especially instagram where you were able to broadcast an image um that may not even be true um you know you could filter and 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 capture other people's photos and and give someone an impression that you are something different um, and you see that in products as well. You see yeah. products that come out of nowhere positioned at ridiculously high price points with no pedigree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, and some of them do very well. And so God bless them to be able to do that. Personally, uh, I've always been inspired by those people who can do that. Mm. I just can't do it. Um, it just doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like me. Um, so I, I love the idea of presenting your best self because it's, it's something that I believe in very much. Um, I do a lot of work with young people in my hometown and we talk about this a lot. Um, what kind of work? I'm sorry. Well, um, I grew up in a small town in Northeast Connecticut, um, 
where I'll give you an example. My my I graduated in 1998 with about mm-hmm. 100 and I don't know, 120, 140 kids. Not but our fresh time. our our freshman class was closer to almost 300. So, um, and that's not because of anything other than some, some kids just had to go to work. Yeah. Some people had to leave school and go to work early. And that's just, you know, that's the product of their environment. Um, and, and it's easy to rush to judgment or to think that, you know, you know, this person's a loser or this person's that, but you don't, you don't know what they came from. And, and, um, what I, spend a lot of time doing is raising money for a particular program called career pathways, um, which helps. And we're a public school. So it's basically private funding to help the public school in my hometown, give kids, um, opportunities to go experience real, real world stuff, Mm -hmm. um, specifically rooted in career options. So whether they have to leave at 16, 18, go on to college, go to trade school, go direct to career, go into the military, um, that they have some sort of really authentic fundamental basis to go. Some of like life skills as far as like, you know, things that everyone says they should teach in in most schools, like budgeting and how to, how to balance a checkbook. But but now, now even more specific to all, to be able to, um, identify a pathway Mm -hmm. and, and basically set a major. So by the time you graduate, you will graduate with a portfolio, um, with a resume, with uh, real life experience, on the job training. Um, yeah. Let's say you're a carpenter, you're going to get a letter of recommendation from a local carpenter that says this person is hireable when yeah. they graduate high school, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> when I was in high school, I didn't do that. I was a musician, I was a drummer. I wanted to go to music school. You know, that was my whole plan. I wanted to get out of town as fast as possible to go live in a big city and be something else. Um, so Did to say I didn't support? Did you have support? Totally. Okay, good. Totally. Yeah. My, my folks supported me. Uh, I have a twin sister. She did this. She did the, the same thing in theater. Um, okay. So I am preconditioned to be in front of people because I'm, I'm a musician. So, you know, the idea of having a microphone and being in front of people and that kind of stuff actually comes naturally. Um, but doing it confidently is something that even now at 40 years old is still something to your point that I perfect and I brush up on and, you know, I try to make better, um, which is always the quest of a musician. I mean, the thing that's so crazy about being an artist is, and it goes back to what you said about, you know, how would I rate the cigar? There's, there's never such thing as perfection. Like you, you can never achieve total success as an artist because there will always be people who critique your work negatively, even if it's your best work. Well, and chances just, are, I'm not to, to step on that, but I mean, I, it's an age old saying, and I, I know that I'm like this. I assume both of you are as well, but you're probably your biggest critic as well. Of course. <laughs> um, but I think artists tend to be um, self-conscious and negative. Um, I think I've learned to get over that. So. Mm-hmm. I also, I'm willing to give myself credit where it's due, where sometimes artists aren't. So I look at a portfolio of product. I look at Kylie sitting there beautifully dressed on this call. And, and you know, I feel proud that I hired Kylie. I mean, yeah, that's an achievement. We're smoking absolutely. Sterling and Timeless Supreme. I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to criticize myself for that. That was a job well done. That speaks volumes of both but of you. It's not, it's not, um, there is no, no perfection. You're always kind of tweaking and tweaking and trying to make it better and trying to be, um, trying to be better. She's a but nine out of 10. Is that what you're saying? Like nothing <laughs> I mean, you haven't. <laughs> Solid nine. <laughs> Sorry. I had to just based on the I'll previous conversation. It. I'll take it. But I think, um, to be your best self, means that you have to totally own all of the inventory of your experiences. 
you can't shelf something, pretend something didn't happen. You are a hundred percent your experience, the sum of your experiences. Yes. Um, and I, I fear that in the generation that's growing up now, they don't understand that arithmetic because they are being inspired by people who are not telling the truth right. about themselves. It's all an image thing. It's all an image. Um, and that, that gives me a lot of concern. And particularly as a father of two young daughters, right. I can't imagine what it's going to be like, you know, as, as they get older. Um, but I, I think that the, the journey of um, being true to oneself and presenting one's best self, you have to be authentic in the moment. So that leads me to the fact that for years, I've, I've worn suits every day. That wasn't to be pompous or to show off or because the product of where I worked required me to wear a suit. Sure. I mean, it's just that simple. Was that comfortable at first? Was that like, what were you wearing those before that? Or is this just like, all right, so this is what I have to do now. This is, well, this I'm, is a, I'm, a, I'm a jazz drummer. So even going back to college, I would leave my apartment at 9 a.m. dressed because I would go to classes. Then I would go to work at a cigar shop, which everyone kind of dressed up a little. Mm -hmm. And then I would go to a gig playing in a wine bar or some place, which was a, a jazz trio gig, which of course you had to be dressed up. Sure. So I had to dress for my night when I left in the morning. Oh my God. And so I, I was always kind of um, a little more dressed, maybe certainly than my peers. I mean, showing up Berkeley College. college? Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> for an 8 a.m. class, people are rolling in in pajamas and I ro was rolling in in a sports jacket. Um, I'm sure you got some look. Oh, totally. And and even then people thought I was doing it to be, you know, pompous. Yeah. I really wasn't. It was just I had a gig at 9 p.m. and it was 9 a.m. and I wasn't going to make it home. You were just trying not to spill your coffee in the morning. <laughs> so exactly. then you the entire day at that point. You're like, ah, shit. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I I really believe the, the idea of being true Um it has to be an evolution and always tweaking. And so people have commented like, oh, you're so underdressed when I do these things or even like some of my posts. It's like, well, I'm not, I'm not wearing a suit right now. You know, I mean, this is, this is what it is. Nor do I wear suits when I'm home with my kids on the weekends, you know? Yeah. You sleep in it, right? You sleep in a three piece. I understand. No, I mean, but, but I what think I like about this whole COVID thing if there is a silver lining, um, generationally, we're going back almost a hundred years to 1918, right? Where there was a forced reset. Yep. We've had a lot of resets as a country, uh, and every country in the world has had radical resets in their history. This is a global reset. Yeah. Um, and as unfortunate as it is, and I wish it didn't happen, and I wish we weren't doing this like this, and I wish we were all in your garage. Absolutely. I also wonder from a silver lining standpoint, if this has allowed a sense of reality to return. Um, because I know that when I talk to people, the their their value set has changed dramatically in the last eight weeks oh yeah my, my um, there is and and fear obviously and maybe i'm cynical um but it's it's one of those things is is how long right you know we, we've gone through this before as as a society not just the u.s and everything else but especially the u.s um, you know, you go back to, you said the early 1900s, there was another huge pandemic that was not handled quite the same way. And I'm, we're not going to get into politics. I, I don't like to get into politics a whole lot on this, this show, but, um, you know, in 68, 69, there was a huge pandemic that I just read an article about that. It was interesting. It was, it, the article was about the fact that Woodstock happened during this time. 
And uh, there were a lot of lives. And, and I got to be honest with my I'm, I'm 39, about to turn 40 this year. Michael, same age, graduated in 98. This is something that I had learned about, forgot about. And then throughout all this stuff, no one's talking about. And it's it's very interesting that this is a reset that is kind of been, in a sense, forced upon the everyday person. And it's about that reflection. And I, I've seen it, too. I've seen a lot of people reacting differently and reaching out to people more. We've talked about it on a couple of previous episodes where you're waving to neighbors maybe more. You didn't even know this person. You're like, oh, I wonder if they just moved in. You find Bro, out they've been there for 10 years. I call them COVID chairs. Co so in my neighborhood, there's all these Adirondack chairs now in everyone's front yard, which <laughs> never existed because you didn't sit in your front yard. Oh, no, you have a patio. Know, right. You go in the backyard. Now in everywhere in my neighborhood, there are chairs in the front yard waiting for anyone to pass by drive by just to wave and say hello I'm telling, and, you. <laughs> telling you covid chairs is my new uh no i think it's it's valid i wouldn't market it i think that would come across maybe wrong enough. if you tried to sell Probably. the chairs as such just call them front porch chairs but uh no I, I get what you're saying i mean i come home and and my my girlfriend is uh in, in the bar industry and uh she since march 16th she's been unemployed right so every day I come home, she's got a different story about what happened in the neighborhood. And I live in a cul-de-sac. We're not even talking about a whole lot of traffic, but there's, there's always a story. You know, her, she sees something out the front window. There's a house for sale across the way. And she said, OK, so there were six families that looked at it today and, <laughs> and one looked really nice. The other one, I don't know. I didn't have a good vibe from him. I'm like, did you talk to him? She's like, no, just from the window. I just didn't have a good vibe. Oh, but the next family <laughs> had a really cute little, you know, it's just like it's that you're absolutely on point there. Kylie, how about it's for funny. you? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it was Kylie, go ahead and answer. What about me? What do you want to know? Well, I mean, with with you know, obviously you're not traveling right now, but I mean, as far as just present, and there's a couple of, of uh, questions and comments that I do want to go back to. But Kylie, I want to get you on here with, with you, kind of the initial thing where you know, as far as presenting your best self. I mean, you had you know Michael giving the compliments that are absolutely uh, fair and due uh, to you as far as uh, you know being yeah. on the call here and. And being a, a fantastic hire, you've had a great presence, you know, from from at least my vantage point. Um, I've enjoyed getting to know you. You had a couple of people like Jake uh, Sanders, who used to be a part of this podcast on the air all the time. He's a part of it pretty much every week. Uh, but he's an indie now managing a, a, a humidor. Um, and he's giving you crap about it. You know what I mean? So there's like both sides of that. They're compliments. On both crap? Sides. He was about, you know, you you dressing nicely. Remember that? Oh, come on. But going into these cigar shops and everything, and, and we can also address the fact that, you know, being being a female going into it, we, we've talked about that personally. And even on podcast, we had uh, a, a two part uh, episode, if you will, from two different ones. We had um, Amy, who owns a, a Irish pub here in town and being a woman in the whiskey world. I think you watched that one, Kylie. And then the following yeah. week with Laurel Tilly, who's in the cigar industry with Macanudo. And we had that part of it. So you presenting your best self going in there. I mean, what what struggles do you have? I mean, how do you handle those things? When you walk through a door, people don't understand being a, a, a salesperson, let alone someone that is walking in physically into a door, because that does not happen as much in this day and age. So you have to basically be prepped, waking up, going into the day. Yeah. So uh, I think this job poses a lot of challenges as is coming from bartending and transitioning into sales, I think that, that that's a pretty big jump. It's similar, but it's different. Uh, bartending, you're going to the same place every day. Now I'm going to seven-ish states in an eight-week rotation. So that part of it already changes, you know, how I carry myself throughout the week and how I prepare to be able to present my best self. Now, walking into a shop, it's typically... I get a lot of, oh, sweetie, can, can we help you? Yeah. And it's... It, because you're walking in almost as a guest, whereas a bartender where you were, you know, in, previously, even in the cigar I'm world, that way. They're, they're walking into, they're the guest. They're, they're walking into you. I mean, you're, it's your place. Well, and, you know, I think from bartending, I've been able to kind of become a little bit quicker with how I respond to things like that. And in a kind of snarky manner sometimes let's call it um, witty let's call it witty okay that sounds good witty sounds good um but you know they'll say oh sweetie can we help you i say i don't know but maybe i can help you 
and just to kind of turn it around a little bit, but that's pretty challenging. I mean, walking in in a suit to middle of nowhere, Illinois, is very different than walking into a suit in a shop in downtown Chicago. Sure. It's very different. And I have to kind of gauge where I'm going and decide what I'm going to wear. That's, I mean, that's, we're talking about the idea of the suit. And, you know, we talk about this a lot as a team about dress for where you're going, dress for your events. You know, the tent event, it's kind of hard when it's like 30 degrees and the doors are open to a tent to, you know, come out. We have heaters there. All right. It's not, it's. That also goes back to how we've evolved. So we've had to evolve, you know, when, when, 2011 2012 i was adamant that suit shirt tie reigns supreme for men for women it's the equivalent of whatever that is um as i've evolved it's also i realized that sometimes by being overly formal we are coming in at a point of um disconnect because by being so overly formal, we can't possibly connect with whether it's a store owner, a manager, consumers to that point um, who are not dressed that way. Sure. <clears throat> the idea of it was not to be a costume. The idea of it was to be dressed to your best dressed guest. That is how that was how I was brought up in my Davidoff days. Yeah. <clears throat> we evolved it in the store there. That's what we do in that Sherman uh, at the townhouse. And so it only made sense to evolve that into our sales uh, team. What we've learned over time is that being best to your dressed guest means if your best dressed guest, and this is very Dr. Seuss, if your best <laughs> dressed guest like is it. in shorts and a t-shirt, and so is the manager. Mm-hmm. If you walk in in a tie, it's going to be very difficult to have a conversation and make anyone feel comfortable that our products resonate. So we've evolved that thinking. Presenting our best self is different. Presenting our best self authentically means we have to be dressed to the best dressed guest of the day, of the place, of the city. And so that might mean a polo shirt. That might mean something else. But we want to make sure that we are delivering on uh, the merit and equity of our brand. But we're not a pompous cigar. You can buy a Metropolitan for $6, $5. So, you know, our evolution is also, our our thinking has evolved to make sure that we are much more inclusive to an audience. And and we're not just, we're not just getting dressed up because it's our costume. It's, It's not our costume. And as we expand nationally and we expand globally, and it's very important that we make sure that we're represented authentically where we present ourselves um, in the best possible way, but not in a way that should disqualify us from consideration because we come in here when that's not the intention at all. No, but I think, you know, and and Kylie, please continue, but I think it's something that you still, you say authentic, and I like that because, again, that is presenting your best self and the topic that we're talking about tonight is that, yeah, maybe you don't, you, you don't come in and a lot of times there's that saying that, you know, sometimes the person wears the suit and other times the suit wears the person. And I think sometimes you come in there and, and Kylie has come in to say, say the tender box piece and where you do have some people that are dressed nicely, if you will, in suits after work and stuff like that. And you have people that are in, in T-shirts and, and shorts and it has nothing to do with how much they make. It has nothing to do with what they do for a living. It's just or even their personality. This is just how they ended up in this shop because it is kind of a, a um, it's not known to be one way or the other, right? There, there's both sides of it. So Kylie comes in in a, in a, in a suit, but it's Kylie. It's, it's <laughs> no, I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's authentic to her. It's authentic. It's the person wearing the suit <laughs> is, right. is I think the, the biggest aspect that I can say as far as what I know about Nat Sherman by way of Kylie, who is representing the company, this is something that I think is one of the biggest challenges for a lot of people is that you dress for the, the job you want. You dress for the role you or how you want to be perceived. If you're so, like you were talking about, Michael, 
and, and, and Kylie coming into the store, if you walked in in a you know your brand new suit, you feel a little bit better about yourself a lot of times. But if you walk in and it's like say a a boutique cigar shop where everyone's wearing you know you know kind of the hoodies and holy jeans and stuff like that, I know it's a little bit of stereotype in the industry, but and you walk in there you have more to prove to that audience that you're you're Kylie with Nat Sherman, not I'm the Nat Sherman rep. And they're going to look at you like, yeah, you are the Nat Sherman rep. Well, and to be fair, we've done the uh, smoking jacket event in November, two years in a row. And we figured out that there's different ideas of what people understand as being a certain way. Like you said, you were wearing a smoking jacket, looked like a smoking sweater to me, but that's just my impression. It was a nice and sweater. So, <laughs> <laughs> but then Leo shows up in this velvet robe. He did. He did. And so it's, you know, it's all up to interpretation. And so I, you know, I tried to stick with a lot of solid colors, not like, you know, 2000s, my Kirklots, but um, (laughs) I try to stick with some pretty basic solid colors because it's just, you know, if I, oh man, I've seen some outfits, but I don't want to attract too much attention because I already attract attention when I walk into a shop. It's just kind of the way it is. Um, That's it. So it's, then they get to know you and you you draw more attention. Yeah, <laughs> I know I do. Um, <laughs> but then but, you also set expectations. That's it. Absolutely. And whether it's a brand, a company, or a person, what we're up against is the expectations and the ability to evolve. No different than <clears throat> um, you said that you were surprised because Supreme was outside of the box for Nat Sherman. Me, That's yes, yes. Your expectation was historically mild Dominican soft. So how do we authentically evolve to maintain relevancy, um, to not all of a sudden come out with some ass kicker out of the blue, but to do it in a way that preserves like we preserve the consistency of our product and we preserve the consistency of our blends, how do we preserve the consistency of the equity of our brand? Yeah. One of the unique things about us is we are an American company. Our products are not made in America, but as a company and a brand, the DNA of us, we are American. We're New York, which is everything. So imagine a day in the new, in the Nat Sherman townhouse today, it is not that different than a day at the Nat Sherman store at 1400 Broadway in 1930 when Nat was in the building. Yeah. You had politicians, you had day laborers, you got unemployed people, you got homeless people. But everybody wants to have that experience. And it means different things for all of them. How do you create an experience that is authentic for you know, the entire spectrum of consumer. Well, let me uh, throw this up there. I do have those questions I, I want to get back to here in a little bit yeah, here. Ray but said something good. Yeah, Ray said something on the subject of the townhouse. So again, you know, Michael, sorry to block you with this uh, comment. Sure. It's, a, it's a wordy one. Uh, on the subject of the townhouse, never have I uh, felt intimidated by the suits behind the counters in there, which is what you're kind of talking about. Uh, I've always found the personality of the staff there to surpass the visual image. I've seen all manner of all manner of customers in that store, and all seem very comfortable. So, I mean, there's there's someone that has been in said townhouse and and has sensed that. I mean, it's it's something. So you're asking that, and maybe let me let me put that to Kylie, if you will, because you kind of you you ask the question, making a point, Michael, about how do you do that with with the the full spectrum. I mean, Kylie, you've seen that not only in the townhouse, I'm sure, but you worked at uh, another cigar lounge. And you've been in countless others since. I mean, how do you do that? How does one walk into a, a, a position where they, they don't know necessarily? Like everyone says, you know, you want to you know, dress to impress in a job interview. Same way. This is a classic example. So you dress for the job you want. So you overdress if you want to. But sometimes that backfires depending on the position. So you, sure. you dress a little bit uh, to the greatest common denominator, as Michael alluded to. But how do you do that, Kylie? So I think about, um, you know, in Step Brothers, where they're going on that job interview and they're going to the job interview to interview, you know, to clean toilets and they're both wearing tuxedos, right? That's right. 
So mind you, they I went think, in together to the interview. Right. <laughs> Interviewed at the same time. But I think it's, you know, working in a cigar lounge, you know, one of my bosses told me, he said, you're really, really good at, you know, changing up the way you talk to people as you move from table to table that you don't approach, you know, a 70 year old couple the same way you approach a group of 24 year old frat boys. Sure. It's different. The conversation's different. The style of the conversation, the way that the conversation flows is different. So I think that that applies too to kind of what we're talking about, about going from store to store to lounge to strip mall vape shop. There is no second chance making a first impression, but you also get to make a second impression. That's right. And for me, that's where, you know, if I walk in, if, if I'm suited up for the day and I, um, walk into a store where everyone is casual, the first impression I know going in is not going to be helpful for what I want to achieve. Right. Which means that I need to deliver second impression twice as strong as the first impression walking in the door. So if I walk in suit and tie, chances are at this point, no one, no one would be surprised if I walk in suit, shirt, and tie. What they might be surprised at to deliver a second impression is approachability, normalcy. You know, I the fact that... that yeah, but there, there's yeah, the old there. doing. There's effort there that you have it. You, you, you're well. There's you're, not effort there because that's what's on. No, you're, you're, I think you're. I think you're kind of breezing over that part of it because you mentioned it early, Michael. Is that there is a, a generation coming up right now that with what we're dealing with is that people don't necessarily always think about the way I took it is that they don't think about the consequences of like their past actions. They don't. They they almost can just delete it out of their mind that this didn't happen. So this is something that there are a lot of people, in my opinion that they won't take the effort of going back in there. They won't take that, that they'll be like, for this you know, example, if you will, of going into a, an account, right? And I think this applies to a lot of other situations. You may not always get a second impression, but if you get that opportunity, you take what you learned from the first one and you, you, you actually go full circle. You take your previous experiences so that you, you, you take accountability for your actions the first time so that when you get the chance to take a second impression, you actually do it first of all, and then you you adapt. You 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 learn from your experience. I, I think that's a valid point that you say that it, it's like a no brainer. But to a lot of people, that is a a huge option. Let me tweak my point. Okay. <laughs> the first time you see Pete Johnson, it is very easy to draw a conclusion about who Pete is. <clears throat> He's a tattooed guy that wears black. Right. When you meet Pete Johnson, you, there is an opportunity for Pete to change expectations. Pete is a is a wine connoisseur. Yeah. It's one of the reasons we are as close as we are, because we, we relate to wine. Sure. We talk wine all the time. I would imagine most folks just looking at pictures of my dear friend Pete, Tetuai Cigars Havana Cellars, would not conclude that he is a wine expert. Sure. But he is. What I'm saying is you can make the second impression immediately following the first impression gotcha. because the first impression is preconceived. And so I know walking into places, people have um, a preconceived idea of who I am. So if I walk into a store in a major city where most people are dressed I'm going to meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. But the moment we drive out to the suburbs, I know that the perception will change. It's my job to deliver when I walk in my authenticity as a person, not of my costume, not of what I'm wearing, but to deliver the authenticity of me like we're talking now. So if I was doing this same conversation today, yeah, in a tuxedo or in a suit or in a sweatsuit, the content of this conversation would be exactly the same. So I think there is an opportunity to give a second impression to be able to change someone's preconceived ideas. 
that they may have when you walk in in a suit. So you're and saying that's where you go. I'm saying immediately walking in, I, I need to make sure that someone knows, even though I'm wearing a suit, I'm still me. And I'm me in a leather jacket outside. I'm me in sweats playing with my kids. I'm me in a suit in a board meeting. Yeah. It's all the it's all the same. And I think that's where the authenticity and presenting your best self really um, rings true. Being your being, bringing your best self is not necessarily what you wear. It's who you are. Absolutely. And it's important to deliver your personality above and in front of your persona. Well, absolutely. I think it is. It is who you are. And I think that's something that you're speaking of something that I think that you're, you're very, um, <clears throat> you're, you're very observant. And I think this is something about, um, knowing your audience. There is a, a part of sales, but I think this applies to other aspects of life as well. I'm a drummer. I have you're to know my audience. You have to. Yeah. If you see a room, I mean, so let me, let me go to that, that, that musical side or a sales side for, for Kylie or, or you know, anyone out there is that, you know, if you see that, you know, I think that's a valid point. If you see the room as a, as a drummer, as a musician is not responding well, that's exactly what you're saying. You stay true to what the, the band is doing, but at the same time, you try to bring the room back. Is that, is that something that you would say you used to do more of? A thousand percent. And, and, and we do it. Place. We, we do it not only, let's say I'm doing an event, things that typically work in events, let's say a, a component tasting. If the room isn't engaged today the way the room was engaged yesterday, you can't just continue the same show. Right. You, you have to improvise and change the show to make sure it resonates with a new audience. That's exactly the same as it is with sales and even developing product. If you look at our portfolio, as, a, as an American luxury brand, we connect with people differently. Yeah. Well, if the idea of American luxury isn't connecting, if Sterling isn't connecting because it's $18, no problem. Let's spend a lot more time talking about Metropolitan. Sure. Because Metropolitan is as much, if not more, of what Nat Sherman is than Sterling is. Sure. Nat, Metropolitan is... Five dollars to eight dollars, five dollars to ten dollars, whatever it depends on where you live. But it's a it is a pedestrian price, high quality, very consistent, and we can start the conversation there if that's the best place for you to enter our world. But if I'm in New York City, I am probably better served for more people entering with Sterling, timeless as a whole, and then introducing Metropolitan. Because they are already, they have an expectation of this New York City urban luxury experience. No, I think if, if you want to talk about bring your bring your own self, bring your best self, when you have a portfolio as diverse as ours, it allows us to play a different hand. You know, we have three different doors that you can open to experience our product. So when, when we talk about our brand, we say white collar, blue collar, no collar. <laughs> All three of those are equally valuable to sure. what Nat Sherman is. And depending on how you enter, you know, it's all a maze. It all brings you back to the same place, which is Nat Sherman. Depending on how you enter, you take a different path to understand who we are and what we do. Yeah. It's our job to make sure that walking into a different place, we're opening the right door so they take the right path through our products. So sometimes it's lead with timeless. Sometimes it's lead with a limited. Sometimes it's lead with Metropolitan or Metropolitan Host, our oldest products. But that's how you're going to navigate who we are. And at the end of the day, you may walk in in shorts. Mentally, you're going to leave in a suit. Yeah. And for others, you may walk in in a suit and you may leave enjoying us in shorts. With what? your friends in a barbecue. What makes us authentic is the fact that we're all of it. And that's yep. what makes that's what makes New York great. That's what makes Nat Sherman great. That's just who we are. 
And I got to tell, if anyone's, you know, actually listening between the lines here, and I don't know, Michael, if you you intended this or not, but that is uh, not only a great literal example, but I think it's a great metaphorical example for for you as a person, Kylie as a person, anyone out there as a person. It's it's absolutely you like you mentioned. You know, you're you know you're known for a suit in this industry, but you might be known for something different as your your girls get older and you're you're at a soccer game or whatever. You're not going to be you know, Michael Herklotz, the suit cigar guy, all the people will probably know you're in the cigar business, but you're also the girl's father. You're, you're, you're that person. But as you have that conversation, as you continue to get to know these people and have those conversations, it's going to be the same end result on your overall personality, the authenticity of who you are as a person. So I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned always from business. But when you explain this whole Nat Sherman portfolio and going into these different rooms, this is any room that you walk into, I feel like. This is something that you as a person, whether you're at work or not, this is this is who you are and never be intimidated by it. I do want to go to uh, Jake Sanders had a, a question and this is says to Michael, but Kylie, feel free to chime in as well. Uh, Michael, was there a time in your life that you felt you had to switch lanes and switch passions? Did this lead to uh, moments where you had a loss of identity? If so, what did you do during downtime to get out of that hole? Um, it's it's this is a great question, and it's something I talk about a lot. I wanted to be a drummer. Period. I mean, if you had asked me when I was eighteen, what do you think about being? Uh, I don't know. Do you want to run a cigar company? I mean, I never smoked a cigar. I never saw anyone smoke a cigar. It didn't, you know, it doesn't yeah. resonate with me at all. So clearly I have switched lanes from sure. wanting to pursue music as a professional drummer to now running a cigar company. What has been helpful for me, um, and I, I, I want to give a shout out, uh, Tobacco Business Magazine just did a feature on me and it's talk about uh, meaningful moments in one's life. I'm on the cover of this issue of Tobacco Business Magazine. Is it is it out yet, or is it coming it's out? out? It's out. It's okay. out. Um, it's the I think it's the May June issue, okay. and it actually highlights a lot of this topic. Nice. Um, I wanted to be a drummer because it was my favorite thing to do. I love playing drums. I love performing. I love being in front of people. I love collaborating. When I got into the cigar business, it was in my pursuit of music. So cigars was a hobby as my hobby of music was becoming a profession and a pursuit. So even though I was seven days a week working in the cigar business and performing and going to school uh, on the music side, my days working cigars were days off as far as I was concerned because yeah. they were hobby days yeah. that I got paid for. Yeah. When I moved to New York, a lot of my my um, classmates also moved to New York. They were doing day jobs like either restaurant work when they wanted to be a musician or they were working in studios, but they were runners, like getting coffee and like doing, you know, doing post college when you say that. Right. Correct. Yeah. Right after college. Yeah. Yeah. So I graduated college 2002 and moved to New York. I moved to New York before I graduated. I went back to Boston to graduate and then came back. Okay. Sorry. I just want to snapshot. Yes. Um, but I can remember bumping into classmates in New York and I was dressed, uh, being embarrassed. Like I've got this day job that has nothing to do with music and I'm bumping into them and we'd bump into each other because I was still playing. So I'd bump into them in clubs playing gigs at night and, you know, they're asking me what I'm doing and I'm working in a cigar shop as a sales associate. And they were like, oh, man, you know, I'm working at Sony. Well, congratulations. But I was at Sony today, too. Yeah. But I was in Tommy Matola's office filling his humidor, talking about cigars and music. You were running to Starbucks getting coffee for somebody on a different floor. That forgot your name. <laughs> cigars was something that allowed me to connect on a different level with the people I always dreamed of connecting with in the music world. Sure. And then the question is why? Well, it allows us to connect passionately about something we're passionate about. And so 
The answer is yes, I changed lanes because I opted in cigars over music um, in, a, in a couple key moments. 2006, I became the general manager of Davidoff Columbus Circle. I knew at that moment that was going to be a much heavier job. Mm -hmm. uh, 2008, I took over Davidoff New York stores. I knew that was going to be a much heavier job. And then 2011, I left Davidoff to join Nat Sherman. And clearly that was an all in play. Um, As it turned but out. I, st I still played a lot. Good. But I, what I would reiterate is, although I changed lanes, I didn't shift passions because the things I was passionate the most about, I still am, which is being creative, being passionate, doing my favorite things and making a living. Yeah. And I can still do that in the cigar business and probably more so um, than I could have as a musician. Nice. So um, I, I, I'm, I, I was not depressed about it. Um, I certainly had moments of uncertainty, but when you get above the superficial uh, assessment of role or superficial assessment of uh, lane and instead ask yourself, why is it that I was in that lane? Well, I was in that lane because I liked being creative. I liked connecting with people. I liked performing. I liked leading a band. I liked, in, um, uh, composing and improvising. I do all of that every single day of my job. That's a super powerful statement. I mean, that that's that's a big takeaway, I think, for a lot of people, honestly, because it is absolutely that that resonates to to a lot of people that are thinking that, you know, if you have that passion like you had with music um, and, and now you're doing something different. What I what I took from that story and, and I don't know, Kylie, I don't know if you, you agree with this or not, but it's while you were going through that transition you did actually allude to there were times where you kind of had that little bit of doubt. You had like, you're running into these people, but you quickly realize, and maybe quickly isn't just five minutes. It could have been five days, five weeks, five months that you're just like, wait a second. No, I don't feel bad about this. Like, well, I still have it. I still have it. Yeah. But, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not about, um, he asked about a loss of identity. And I think that's the piece that I've wrestled with because I identified as a musician who had a day job in the cigar business. I now identify or people would identify me as a cigar guy who happens to play drums. What do you identify with? What I identify is I take all the roles and jobs and companies out. And I identify as a guy who is passionate about things and who would not do well making a living at something that I am not truly passionate about. And so I get to go to work every day getting paid to do things I'm passionate about. In 2002, I was passionate about cigars and passionate about music, and I made a living at both. Yeah. And it took, it took both to make it through. In 2020, I make a living in the premium, premium cigar world, premium yeah. tobacco space. I still play music. That's still part of my identity. There isn't a single interview that people don't talk about music and why it's meaningful to me. And so I actually am more confident today um, in my identity as a musician because just because I'm not making a living doing it doesn't mean I'm not a musician. It means that I am still a very passionate, emotional, uh, complex person who yeah. has been able to uh, make a living doing the things I love to do. And most likely, you probably would not have the, the said success so far in the cigar industry if you didn't carry over everything that you brought into it. I will tell you, man, you look at the greatest success stories in the cigar business in the liquor business and in the food business, they're all artists. That's right. All of them, musicians, visual artists, they're all artists. 
Kylie, how about you? I mean, I, I know we, we, we've talked about this, but I mean, I know you went through a transition, obviously, into the, the role you're in and, and other transitions in your life. I mean, yeah, I, I think kind of the similar thing. I mean, th- I had a lot of a lot of notes. And, and what I like about this part of the podcast is that the conversation, I thought this might be a way it went, but it, uh, it is not necessarily a plan, which is what I love about this, because <laughs> I learned so much from from talking to people. And again, it's the the, the common bond. You, you talked about the uh, Michael when you went into these these places that, at Sony, and it was about the the cigars. Well, this is one of those things that it was uh, something that you have this common bond over something. As we get older, we've we've talked about on the podcast before, where as you get older, it's you, you kind of lose the proximity of your friends from growing up, from from college, all these things. And then as you get into the the workforce whether you have kids or not, it's like your, your social circle changes. But the one thing that I think all three of us really share is the passion of, of not only like helping people that, that like learn about something that we're passionate about and, and reaching out to them. But as you go through your personal struggles is that there's this, this, this path that is carrying you through. Yeah. Um, As you know, the, you know, I mean, because of Liz working in restaurants and, you know, hearing what she goes through on a daily basis with that, um, a lot of what I do now is very similar to what I was doing as a bartender, except, you know, being in a stationary spot versus moving around from store to store all day, depending on what my day looks like. Yeah. Um, But, you know, each industry kind of has its challenges and bartending, you know, there's, there's a lot of activity, a lot of partying going on and that gets old after a while. And I guess I kind of, you know, I got to a point where I was, you know, sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know, I'd work a shift till 4am and then have to be back at 10am. And that's not for the faint of heart by any means. And, you know, we still do that stuff too. Michael came out to do an event with me in Indianapolis and, you know, we didn't get done with the event back to the hotel till almost 3 a.m. And I think his flight was at like 830 or something like that. So that still exists (laughs) and it's still a challenge, but it's it's a little bit different. And we get a little bit more leeway about, you know, how our schedule is organized. But... (sighs) making that decision to go in to do something that I wasn't sure that I could do was kind of a challenge. And, you know, Brandon Harvey, who is, you know, our rep in Baltimore and Pittsburgh, and he covers all of those areas. He was saying that, you know, our team is unique and that we're different. And that's kind of, Oh, there it is. Our team is as diverse as our portfolio. Great work guys and ladies. So, our team is diverse and there's definitely people on our team that I call for different things, but it takes time to, you know, we're talking about this idea of being genuine and presenting your best self and presenting your best self is being honest about what your shortcomings might be and asking for help when it's necessary. Um, Which is kind of what happened with me in bartending. I had to ask for help about how to get out of it. And it wasn't just, you know, a one piece journey where it was like, oh, there's the job, I'm gonna apply for it. And then it happened. It, it, it took time, it took years before I got into a position like that, before I was ready to take a position like that. And I guess the idea of like staying in the same lane or switching lanes, it is a lane switch, but I'm still on the same highway because there's so many parts about it that are just so similar. <laughs> are there times when I leave a customer and I go cry? Absolutely. 100%. It has happened. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I know you guys are just terrible, but it does. It just it it just happens and sometimes it gets to be overwhelming. But if I take a second, I can continue to move forward, understand what went wrong, understand how I processed it and then move along with my day. And accepting that, you know, not every interaction is going to be perfect. It just happens, especially with people you don't know. And you're walking in off the street. You try to call ahead to say, hey, you know, can I stop by? And nobody answers because they haven't paid their phone bill in six months. That happens. And then they're surprised to see you. Yeah. And so catching people off guard is tricky. But 
I don't know. Sometimes you have to, you have to forget, you have to let go of the idea of who you are to embrace the idea of everything that you can be. And that's when those lame jumps happen. And that's when those big leaps happen. Like you guys, you know, I moved to Chicago last year. Mm -hmm. Everything about my life, my daily life, going to the grocery store is different. I mean, everybody's going to the grocery store is different now, but like even something as simple as parking underground versus in a parking lot above ground at a grocery store is different. Yeah. It's just, but I couldn't be happier. That's good. How, how do you guys, go ahead. Finish. No, I was just going to say, sometimes you have to make those leaps and you have to be honest with yourself about what things matter most to you. Yeah. And figuring so, out what those things are. Yeah. Yeah. How do you guys deal with um, when we're talking about presenting your best self? Kylie, you kind of led me to this point is, you know, you go into these places and you, you, know, you say you, you leave some places and you feel defeated. Right. That's how I want to yeah. put that. Um, I think when we talked about earlier about like social media, we talked about these things. Uh, it's, it's other people's opinions. And, and how does that frame you being your best self? I think as, as people get older and I, it's different for everyone, it's not just an age thing. It's, it's absolutely a life thing. Um, it's what you're going through, what you have gone through and, and bringing it, it to a, um, a summary of where you're at in life. But when, when you are being what you might think is your, your best self and it's not good enough, or you're getting a lot of critique, whether it be on social media, you're getting turned down in sales, you're, um, you're having friends or family that are looking at you, you're like, I'm not quite so sure about, that's why I asked you, Michael, earlier about, you know, support with, uh, you know, being, you know, I'm gonna get out of high school and I'm gonna be a musician. We all know that there's a lot of people, like even the cigar industry is much the same way, right? A lot of people's dreams that that you have family and friends that are around the, the, the horn there and they're just like, Really, this this is this is what you think you're gonna do with your life. You're gonna make money doing this, but even now, further down the road, when when you're being what you've you've established as your best self so far, and I think that's a good point is is when you're doing present your best self. This is where you're at right now. This is your best self up until this point is the goal. And and going back to the rating of cigars and everything else that you both kind of said it, and Michael, you said it a lot is that nine out of 10, because you still haven't gotten to that 10 out of 10 performance, whether it be music, whether it be cigars, whether it be your interaction with other people, but other people's opinions are a constant struggle for, for I think most people, because it is one of the loudest things in, in someone's mind. Once they are by themselves sitting around smoking a cigar, drinking a bourbon, whatever it might be, you're sitting down by yourself and you're thinking, you're reflecting about, everything that happened in your day, the last week, the last year, where you're at in life. And uh, things are good, things are bad, but the other people's opinions are just, so, in my opinion, so, so loud for a lot of people. The yeah. problem is never has the record of opinion been more public than today. Yeah. Yeah. So historically, you make a cigar, you judge whether people like it or not by whether it sells. Correct. Um, you put out an album, you judge whether people like it or not by whether it sells. Mm -hmm. You play a concert, you judge whether people like it or not by whether they clap or whether they buy tickets. Now, the ability to present opinions anonymously and without the opportunity for debate um, tends to... Um, amplify the negative well a lot of the, and, the loudest opinions are negative that are put of out course, those, those of course yeah if i love something i don't i don't think to go out of my way to post about it you tell now, by the way about it, maybe i also don't go out of my way to post negative because i don't think that helps anybody but a lot of people do but i i think i actually said it in this article in the tobacco business article I was asked about how to measure success. And so I said, you know, the typical measurements of, of success are economical measurements. So you can measure success on cost of goods. You can measure success on last year versus this year. You know, lots of economics as it relates to business uh, or even personally. Mm -hmm. How does my bank account look this year versus last year? How does, you know, does my, is my house better last year than this year? Or am I in a better apartment or whatever it is? What, 
what there is no um, study for is the arithmetic of passion and the arithmetic of emotion. And so what I ask myself is, how am I? I have two beautiful girls. Yeah. I'm married to a beautiful woman. I have a beautiful house. I actually have a driveway now. I mean, you know, like all these, all these things. That, Sometimes the little things that really that set there, you apart, right? There, you is, know, like, there is no way to apply a mathematical equation to identify the success um, year over year on a personal level. Yeah. But if there were a way to ask yourself, is my life better today with the people who are in it versus the people who were in it last year? Have I added more people who make my life better yes. this year than last year? Then I'm up. Or are the people in my life better off this year than they were last year? Then I can check that box. Those are big, say, those are big boxes. Yes, but these are things that you can't possibly measure. Right. But you on can, a, ba on a balance can. sheet. Well, there is no there is no bottom right hand number in that example. Correct. And that's how um, life today tends to measure themselves. We measure ourselves in likes and comments and followers and views. And we measure ourselves in Google Analytics. And we measure ourselves in um, fiscal year over last year and, and margin versus, you know, whatever. But if you, if none of that mattered, and interestingly, I think this last eight weeks has provided an opportunity to look at the emotional balance sheet mm -hmm. over the fiscal balance sheet. When I look at my emotional balance sheet today, I'm spending more time with my family than I've ever spent. I've spent more consecutive days and nights with my wife than I have spent since I met her in 2006. Mm -hmm. Wow. I've spent more, which means I've obviously spent more nights with my kids than I've ever spent since the day they were born. Um, we're doing these great events. Kylie moved to Chicago. Yeah. That's, you know, when I think about the people in my life, whether it's professionally, personally, and obviously in our business, those lines again are blurred. It's very intertwined. You know, Brandon is on here. Brandon just had a, a, a new baby. He's doing oh. great. Congrats, Brad. Employed. So when I think of the value of the of the people who are in my life, the fact that their lives are better, that's almost like the the people in your life are like a mutual fund. And you get the mutual benefit of how their lives are improving. And if that if that residual return can then be applied to your emotional personal balance sheet. You know, then I think we can go back to the earlier question about lane and shift and identity and all yeah. that. You know, what is really important? What's really important is our health, our family's health, our friend's health, you know, that people are okay. If people need help, they ask. If they're not willing to help, if they're not willing to ask, we offer. You yeah. know, this is bringing out the best in people, despite the fact that it is the worst. Yeah. thing we've ever had to deal with in a century. And Kylie, go ahead after this. But I, I think what you're talking about is is the content. I mean, you talk about, you know, social media and things like that. You talk about likes and everything else is that the, the true real, real impact on it is what you're describing the content and quality of of, of your day to day, your your people. You know, it's it's who is I can turn off Instagram tomorrow. Yeah. My life goes on. Your life goes on and your content of what's you're talking what you're talking about that is is truly important presenting your best self you know that that part of it who, who is your best self is is the content not necessarily just your first second third impression it is who you are and that's what I think that that's a big big takeaway is that it is about the content or the quality of the people that you said that you surround yourself with it, it's it's not about other people's opinions in the, the general. It's about 
who you surround yourself with. And it should be a select few that you care about and that you, you are cared for, like cared about from, you know, like these people are, are caring about you and you grow from each other. And when you help them grow, the, the hope is, is that you're observing enough that you can grow from what they're experiencing and they're, they're getting from you. Social media is an awesome opportunity yeah. to give a cleaned up version of whatever message you want to deliver. The problem is it can be altered and that creates false inspiration. But social media is also an awesome opportunity to deliver authenticity Yes. for what matters. And for me, you know, if I just had a live feed going all day, then you'd be looking at spreadsheets and conference calls, which is not fun. Super glamorous. So, Super so glamorous. that's why I don't post, um, you know, every moment of every day looking at conference calls and spreadsheets and budgets and all that kind of stuff. Sure. But I do try and balance the content to at least make sure that I'm delivering a balanced message of what's important and that what's important and authentic for yeah. me is this idea of certainly some formality but also some some informality some family some professional you know it's just it's a snapshot and so if i think if if social media can kind of evolve into being the cliff note version of one's life but it's equally balanced yeah then that inspiration shows that famous, glamorous people wake up ugly. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, people who have a ton of money at some point get concerned about money. Always. All of those things are so important that when I think to the generations before me, those were the things that were instilled that made me who I am. Yeah. The problem is that now people are finding inspiration from things that just aren't authentic or true or honest. And and that sets us up for a world where expectations can't be met. Kylie. Well, so I'm, I guess I, I think of all of this and in, in another school of thought, because I know that nothing is permanent. And I, I acknowledge that nothing is permanent because of how, how different my life has been from phase to phase to phase. And you're also younger with a slightly different perspective too, which is right, right. super valuable so, here. Absolutely. So somebody said, somebody said to me once, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't have your job, if you don't have your apartment or your house, if you don't have a car, if you don't have, if all of your family's gone for whatever reason, are you going to be okay? And that's kind of a challenging question for me because there's this idea of just accepting things for what they are and who they are and not trying to connect to things too deeply for fear of loss of that stuff. But, you know, I try to think about that at the end of the day. Am I happy with who I am on a daily basis? Am I being like intrinsically honest mm -hmm. about you know, how I'm connecting to the world. And, you know, we're talking about this idea of, you know, gauging our self-approval or like Dustin was talking about on this, on the feed here about self-doubt. Oh, you know, it's a great, great comment that he had there. It, it was awesome. But um, I don't want to throw it out there. I'm evaluating on a daily basis. Like I, I think we all have some weird thoughts sometimes. And one of these practices that I have when I'm on my own is that I, I proofread my thoughts. I say things out loud to see if my evaluation of a relationship with somebody or about work or about an interaction that I have with a stranger in the grocery store, do I feel okay about how that interaction went? Because at the end of the day, I'm left with me. And I I'm love the one who has to live in my head. I love the proofreading your own thoughts. That that that's a great concept. I do it all the time. It's terrible. Sometimes to like almost to a fault where it's like I'm concerned that, you know, like my ex-husband passed a couple months ago and we've talked a little bit about this know, even on a personal level, but Absolutely. you know, I didn't I didn't want to go to the funeral if 
I was going to hurt someone else's feelings by being there, specifically his mother. So it's kind of like, I have to say this stuff out loud to myself and to other people to bounce it off and bounce back to think what my intentions are. And we're talking all about that, about what our intentions are and about sales and being genuine about who we are, because you've met salespeople that aren't genuine, that are just chucking out lines and you can tell it's just a recycled pile of garbage that that's a stereotypical like salesperson right. in a negative and way we've done a lot of online learning as a team that's been given to us and you know one of the main points they make is that you know that the biggest key to sales is to be genuine about it and you actually have to like give a shit about what you're doing to be able to be like can you imagine these medical device sale reps like that's got to be miserable. That's got to be a miserable job. You're selling plastic. Yeah. Nothing with love. Stuff that comes off an assembly line. I couldn't imagine selling something like that. So, I don't know. I don't know well, where I was going with that. No, it's a constant struggle. I mean, you it's all about how, like, it's how you spin it. I mean, you can sell it as, as something that you're going to get paid off of, or you can actually believe in what the product is, right? You know, and right now you're bringing that up. And I mean, it's the same thing like pharmaceutical reps. If you truly believe that this is going to help people, you will do so much better. You, right. you, will, you will come across as authentic because that's how you, you, you believe it to be. So if you're just doing it, so you make your neck bonus, that's where the, the, the sleazy used car salesman comes into place. And I know actually a handful personally of very, very genuine used car sales people. Yeah. <laughs> they, they're like, hey, people need cars. I need, I have cars. I'm, I'm, I'm going to sell them cars and it's a business that I work for, but there's nothing wrong with it if you actually believe in it, but you, you're absolutely right about everything you said. I mean, it's, it's a constant thing. I, I do want to go back to that. The proofreading your own thoughts is something that I, I am going to remember from this episode and, uh, this conversation because, uh, you know, a lot of people, they drown themselves in their own thoughts. And, and I think proofreading your own thoughts is a, a great way to, to frame that concept because you can actually get a lot from yourself. As and long I, would, as, I would push back. As long as you're listening to yourself. Right. I want to push back on Dustin because he specifically says, uh, am I good enough to do this? So, Dustin, I don't know what you do. But who's measuring? whether you're good enough it's awesome if if you're doing something you love or you're doing something that you think is meaningful and you think you're doing it well then of course of course you're good enough doing it of course you are and it says you have a good friend ben moore who you're working with he's bouncing stuff off great but you know this idea of how, it goes back to if if I'm good enough means that you are looking for how to measure success or achievement. If measuring success and achievement has to do with someone else's opinion or some, some other outside external uh, measurement, that's bullshit, my man. The question is, you have to ask it. yourself, are you doing good enough? That's the question. Yeah, find if, your... if, you, if you're not, and I will tell you, I ask myself, Every day, am I good enough? Every day. And the answer is no. I don't find that to be a paralyzing fact. The answer is no. So the good news is every day I woke up, I wake up, I have work to do to get better. And that goes back to our rating earlier. You're a nine out of ten right now. I'm a nine. I'm not, there's, there's <laughs> I no love it. Thing, I no absolutely love it. I go back to, and I, I'll be an eight. I'll be a six. It depends on what's happening. You ask me about product, I put nine. <laughs> you ask me personal. Yeah. You know there are. I'm eights and sixes and fours and twos, and that's where I have to improve. But my measurement of success and achievement is my own. Yes. And That's especially it. right now, wait, 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 where wait, these ideas... Sorry, like, real, this, quick, what? real quick. It, before you're measuring up, you got to figure out what your measuring stick is and what that, that, that means to you. It is, like Michael said, it's, it's you got to figure out what your own measuring stick is 
so that if you're a nine out of 10, you're a six out of 10, whatever it is. Measuring it, sticks, not followers. No. Measuring sticks, not likes. Measuring stick, take all that out. Your measuring stick is your personal, emotional balance sheet. It's health. It is not a fiscal balance sheet that is going to determine whether you're good enough. Yeah, it's yeah. your personal balance sheet of people, relationships, friendships, value you bring to other people. Uh, how are you improving other people's lives? Yeah. What are you giving back? That's, that is what returns and makes that's you, that's what validates that you are good enough to do what you do. Yeah. But Kylie, before you go, I think that yeah. Nate brings up a good point. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's everyone's in the same boat that you're in. Right. So, so Nate says, bad news is you are not perfect. The good news is neither is anyone else. Kylie, what were we going to say? About like expectations, I guess, you know, we see people doing this or that, like right now within the last couple of months about what people are doing. Mm -hmm. I've got a, a couple of guys that I'm in a group chat with from Indianapolis and just some old bar friends of mine. And, you know, one of them asked a couple of weeks ago, they're like, hey, what are you guys doing to, you know, further your lives? Just kind of out of nowhere. It's all just memes and, you know, stupid jokes all day that we share. But we get into these deep conversations. And, you know, I'm at home. I'm at home alone with my cat. Like, it's just us. It's a great For cat. Over two months, it's just been us. She is a great cat. Um, but I have to... I have to take it easy on myself because I do see people doing things. People, you know, these guys, you know, they're enrolling in classes, they're doing master class, they're doing all of these different things. And it's just, it, it's hard to not compare yourself to people and feel like you're not doing well enough. And I, I, feel, I feel like that's, you know, similar as far as like our sales team, because we communicate our goals and, you know, new account numbers and events and all of that stuff between our team. And the reality is, is that my territory in January isn't going to be the same as the guy in Florida. Right. And it's just a different measuring stick that I have to use back to this idea, a different measuring stick that I have to use, you know, to gauge where I'm at. He's got six years of experience. I've got two things are different. And I have to and like be easy on myself about that and try not to beat myself up about it. I Kylie, I think that's what I think learn. that's what Ray says here in the comments, and I don't know um, you if you want to bring that up. Ray says, "Michael's talking about two different things. Being oh. good enough at a job is not about your measure, your measure or perspective. It's someone else's. Whether you feel good enough about yourself and self worth is something completely different." Yeah. Point well, well taken. We were having we had a new account contest a couple of months ago, and. Uh, you know, I, I told the guys, I was like, listen, like, I'm, in, I'm not in competition with you guys. I'm in competition with myself. I'm in competition with myself. And the way that I feel about the job I've done at the end of the day is more important than a lot of things to me or other people's opinion of what I've done. So it's. I mean, and it also, it I still also depends on the job. job. It depends on the job. So Absolutely. if you're if you have to if you have to make something like I will give you a great example. I had to build a bike today for my daughter. <laughs> How'd it go? Failed at that job. One wheel out of two or? It was not good. <laughs> it was really now not unicycle. good. unicycle. So being good enough at that job, I was not good enough at that job at all. Um, but I gave, I gave it everything I got. And I didn't give up and I kept, I kept working at it and tried to find solutions. Um, and I was also in that moment, very passionate about trying to get this bike to work mm -hmm. as ridiculous as that sounds. Building no. bikes is nothing I'm passionate about. No, but, but your daughter would have you been have a lot of experience, having a bike. Right? I have none. Um, and I'm not trying to minimize Ray's point here. No. But what I would also say is, Ray, I think this also brings up the opportunity to shift lanes. And so if the measure of your success is someone else's perspective because it relies on uh, deliverables of a job, 
then I think you can look and say, are there other jobs or are there other things that I can take what I'm good at and apply them differently? Yeah. And I know that's easier said than done. And again, I don't want to minimize the point. You got to still pay your bills first. Um, so there are always scenarios and I've worked in scenarios where, um, I've had a boss that has been overly demanding and no matter how good I did my job, it wasn't good enough for my boss. And I was measured solely by my boss's opinion of my performance. Um, but in the long game, when you, when you do your job, the best you can possibly do. You bring everything to your delivery of your job. If you miss a goal, the only thing you are accountable for is to identify yourself. Why did you miss it? And how can you do a better job of achieving it? If you're not willing to do that part, that's your problem. But if you missed goals or you missed a target or you missed some objective to your job that your boss is measuring you on and you can bring with that a self-assessment of these are the things I think I did wrong. These are the things I think I can do better. And then you apply those things or ask for help and improve your performance. Then well, you stay in your lane. You're using two different measuring sticks. I go back to that 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 example, right? You're using just someone else's measuring stick, or you're using theirs as as you know. Obviously, in the situation with a job, you you have to to a point, but do don't lose your own measuring stick as as your personal growth, whether it be professional or personal. But um, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of kind of switch it as we're getting to the end of this here. Ray did have another question. Uh, I want to throw this out to, to Michael because it's out of your uh, territory, Kylie. But uh, Ray says, so he, he's tuning in from a little far away. He, he says, anyways, let's get to the important question out there. When am I going to be able to get Nat Sherman cigars in Saigon? So um, That's brief an awesome answer. question. <laughs> so brief answer. Uh, <laughs> brief answer is we have focused solely on domestic business for the last eight years. Um, is this in the playbook? International growth is in the playbook. Okay. So hopefully sooner than later. In the meantime, <laughs> I would tell you any friend that is in the United States of America, tell them to walk into a local brick and mortar tobacconist, find our product, and tell them to ship it to you. Ray Ray knows where the tinderbox at Easton is. So uh, Ray, there you go. You we we can get Nat Sherman cigars into Saigon, one way or another. There it is. <laughs> uh, so. Let's let's go into closing remarks, but I want to kind of frame this um, with the closing remarks on this topic. We've we've talked about a lot of a lot of great concepts about presenting your best self, but the one thing we haven't really brought in, and and I think that we've uh, we've danced around the, the 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 concept is is the consistency of it. You know, uh, Jake had a great question earlier about switching lanes, about, you know, the self-doubt and all that stuff. But when things are good or bad, it doesn't really matter is that we go forward from this Wednesday night. And, and and I can appreciate, you know, we're talking about content. That's a big part of this podcast is that, you know, it's not just about views. You want to have more people tune in. I mean, that, that's worth everyone's time that we're not just the three of us having a video chat, just just us hanging out, which I would get a lot from, honestly. I, if there was no audience here. I would learn a lot from this conversation. And I think, I, I hope, I guess, that you guys would as well, just getting those thoughts out there and, and bouncing things off. We had a lot of help from the audience that, you know, having comments and everything else. But uh, one question that hasn't really been asked is, is going forward from this, this Wednesday night, going fr forward out of this coronavirus situation we're in, you know, what, what is the consistency? I mean, I look at it a lot of times as, uh, you know, it's um, physical health helps. I, I think it's it's the balance of, of career and personal life. But I'm always curious what people's thoughts are on of how you, you when you're your best self, it's not just about that one time walking into a cigar shop. It's not just that one time making a first impression in a personal level. And it's not just the one morning you wake up. It's it's every morning, every day that you're given 
how do you consistently grow and stay on that path, whether it changes or not? But the consistency, I think, is probably the biggest struggle. So I'll, I'll, I'll introduce that, that, that concept into your closing remarks. And either of you that want to go first, go ahead, please. Uh, I guess finding consistency for me has a lot to do with how I decide to spend my mornings. Honestly, that has a lot to do with it. Like Starbucks not being open fully right now is totally throwing a wrench in my consistency right now. Sure. It's just, I mean, it's simple. It's fairly inexpensive. And it's just one of those things where it's just, it's a part of my routine and sticking to a routine for me is really important. So now that I'm at home, you know, for two months, I have to create a new routine and a new normal for myself, regardless of what the hell else is going out out there, which we're talking a lot about, you know, outside influences and how they help us evaluate our lives. And like I said, at the end of the day, I'm stuck with me. So I have to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to take care of myself and some days putting putting my best foot forward looks like something completely different than it did the day before. If I start my morning by scrolling through Facebook and reading news stories, my morning is going to be different than if I reached out to somebody to see how they're doing that morning. And the key for me to putting to putting my best self forward is asking myself, what have I done for somebody else in a day? Whether it be for a family member or a team member or somebody I know from another part of my life, um, but making sure that I'm doing something for somebody else, like Michael was talking about, about you know, growing value in the mutual funds we share with the people that are in our lives. Am I able to help somebody else? Am I able to do something for somebody else? I went and dropped my grandma off hand sanitizer on Sunday. And I found out that she's been using hand sanitizer as soap, like using it with water in the sink. <clears throat> and so it took about an hour and a lot of masking tape with permanent markers for me to explain to her, like, this is how you do this. And at the end of the day, I was furious that she didn't know how, that somebody hadn't told her how to do it yet. And it, we'd been, you know, stuck for two months. And she's, you know, she's in her 70s. She'd yeah. kill me if she heard me say that. Um, uh, but most likely is not tuning in right now. I hope not. Maybe she, is. But if she is, is. That is awesome. <laughs> no, but there's a lot of care there. <laughs> I hope yeah. she is. Well, and like at the end of the day, you know, I, I was able to do that. I took some to my grandfather. I, you know, took some stuff over to my brother's house and dropped it off. Like all of those things at the end of the day, you know, I was able to do something for somebody else. And that to me changes how I present myself on a daily basis. I had someone ask, tell me once that if I ever came to them with a problem, that they would ask me what I did for somebody else that day. If I'm struggling with anything in my head, my proofread, my proofread thoughts come out and they sound wrong. And I need to call there. to somebody and complain about it. I need to like jump into action and I need to try to do something for somebody else to get myself out of my own head and out of my selfish behavior. Mm -hmm. So that's my closing remarks. No, that's great. That That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Michael. Um, the idea of consistency requires an openness to evolution. And what I thought was the most important to be my best self 10 years ago is not the same thing as it is today. And I can apply that to our business. I can apply that to my family, um, to my personal relationships and friendships. So there has to be both on the individual side as well as your network side. Everyone has to understand that tomorrow is not going to be the same as today. Um, and as long as everyone is willing to be open to the fact that things are going to evolve, then the question is what things through that evolution will be consistent. So 
on a personal side, for me, it's honesty, it's authenticity, because that lends itself to credibility. And credibility allows you to be trustworthy. And at the end of the day, if you're not trustworthy, then the future is going to be very grim. Because the older you get and the more, the more history you have behind you, the harder it is to establish the idea of credibility moving forward. Yeah. Um, so I will sum it down to one thing and I will tie it into both our business side and a personal side, which is if, if you cannot be trusted, then every day is going to be a challenge. And so if you're presenting false pretenses in your social media, if you're presenting a bad deal in business, um, if you are offering friendship or partnership to someone who you don't intend to follow through with, then it's, it's over. Yeah. Just, just log out right now. It's done. Yeah. Um, my, my goal, my, my, um, my advice is you make sure that you are being authentic and truthful to yourself. You make sure that you are being authentic and truthful to the people around you, whether it's your personal rate, uh, relationships or the people you're doing business with. And, you know, being able to do things like this and have honest conversations like this. I love the fact that you said if there were no audience, we'd be having the same conversation and it would be as valuable. I agree a thousand percent. It's awesome. Um, it's nice to be able to say it out loud and remind ourselves that what matters most is that we are our best selves, whether we are shaving in the mirror, making breakfast for our kids, working on a budget, doing a virtual event, working in factories. We're all, you have to be the same person. And it's so much easier to be able to just be authentic and true all the time. Yeah. Whether I'm in a suit or whether I'm in a leather jacket, sweatpants, pajamas, it doesn't make a difference. We don't see what the you, sweatpants, by the way. Ultimate, I'm not wearing any pants. What you, <laughs> what you gonna it is get, cold out there. What you're going to get is the same. That's good. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I'll take take those points. And I, yeah, first of all, thank you guys for being a part of this. This is amazing as always. And um, you know, Kylie, I've been trying to get you on this podcast. And Michael, you'll you'll have to know that this is the only way I could get Kylie on this podcast is uh, by her inviting you. So uh, I appreciate you being on, Michael. As uh, obviously, I mean that's that's without saying. But Kylie, thank you. I know um, you've been a supporter of this podcast for for some time. Uh, with all that being said, I, I look at so my closing remarks, the consistency that I've always struggled with and that those that, that know me or follow me on on Facebook and all that stuff is um, there were years ago that I um, I started checking in um, at the gym and I, my, my saying was focus and focus. It, focus and it became a joke to a lot of people. And then it took about six months, 12 months later that um uh, I inspired some other people to start going to the gym. I lost a lot of weight. I uh, started taking care of myself, and I learned that, that was a big aspect of 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 my consistency is is taking care of myself because I hadn't been doing that. And uh, we all find our outlet, right? And uh, one of the biggest things I'd say is 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 getting rest. Is when you take care of yourself, we drive ourselves absolutely crazy trying to in this conversation, either be someone you're not, or you're trying to be someone that you want to be. But the authenticity that has been the resounding comment, the, the resounding word that people have been using on this, this, this conversation is, is the actual truth. This is, this is the biggest part of it is no matter what you're doing, if you're a salesperson, if you're selling cigars, whiskey, if you're, if you're working in a cubicle, you're, you're working with um, people that you're taking care of their finances. If you're just, if you're, no matter what you're doing, if you're a janitor, if you're a mechanic, if you are running a business, the, the true success is if you are authentic to yourselves. And that's my biggest takeaway of all of this conversation. But, but 
taking care of yourself is really, uh, in my opinion, is the consistency part of it. And, and no matter if you're on social media, if you walk in a room, if you walk into work, if you wake up next to a significant other, um, if you have a, a, a open conversation with a stranger, you're always you always have an audience. And one of the biggest things that I lost a long time ago and I've gained back is sometimes you have to realize that the, the, the biggest contributor to your audience is yourself. And when you stop looking at yourself in the mirror, um, I, I encourage everyone, next time you're having a conversation with someone on the phone and say it's a, um, you're, you're at your house and, or you're at your business and you're, you're having a conversation with someone that, that means a lot, whether it be a big business deal or there's an emotional conversation with someone important in your life. Some of these people that we've, we've referred to that you're trying to bring growth in their life that, that in turn... The hope is, is that you're, you're building your circle is literally walk in front of a mirror with your phone to your ear and you're talking to them and, and watch yourself as you're having this conversation because you are part of the audience. And if you get to be a part of the audience in your mind, you start to present yourself the way you want to be heard. You, you start to realize that it's it, it, that you're a part of this situation because a lot of the times I feel like I've forgotten that and it's always putting other people first, but presenting your, your, your best self is, is, is realizing what that is. And so I think that if you reintroduce yourself as, as the person in the front row of your audience, then, then you're going to realize that, that you have a lot of common interest with the, the message that's being delivered. And if you believe in that, I think that other people will, will follow suit. And I think that's where the authenticity may come into play if you feel like you may be lacking that. So um, with that being said, guys, thank you very much. Thanks to our sponsors. Can, I add, can I add one thing real quick? Always. And that's, that's only um, – we're accessible. So if people watch this and they, and they didn't have a chance to chime in on comments or ask a question, um, I think I'm speaking for the three of us. Absolutely. S send us a message, send us an email, send us a direct message, whatever you have. Um, you know, I, we're all going to be better together. Yeah. Yeah. Learn from each other, get advice. The worst mistake is to not ask for help and assume, you know, the answer or assume no one's going to give you help. So send a message, follow up after this, you know, this isn't over when, well, when we log off. So that's yeah. an open invitation. Absolutely. And John we did a question. We did start also, uh, Michael, I, don't, I know Kylie's a part of it. We started a bourbon and BS community page that this was a part of like the whole idea was is continue the conversation so that there is a community page on Facebook that you guys can be a part of to, yeah, you can post cigar pictures and, and, and bourbon and whiskey pictures, but there's also the, the topics. There's also getting to know each other because this is the day an age that we're in is that you're absolutely right, Michael. I mean, and I appreciate you saying that you guys can absolutely reach out to anyone. And it's, it's, it's huge to hear guests say that on this show, that there is interest in, in people. It's not just about the cigars and whiskey. This is our common bond, but when it comes down to it, that's what part two is about is the conversation afterwards. Yeah. So thank you for saying that very much. Steve, Sean had a question. Sean had a question. Uh, are you guys going to do the raffle for the ashtrays? That's on me, Sean. We are going to do the ra the raffle for the ashtrays tomorrow. Because <laughs> as I was leaving the shop today, I had uh, the cigars. I had everything else. I had every all that stuff. And it was about an hour before the uh, podcast. I texted Kylie. And with some foul language, I was mad at myself that I left that list on the table. So we will do that. Sean, hopefully you didn't just stick around just for that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> If he did, that is a, a marketing tactic, and I'm not. I'm not sorry. No. <laughs> now, yeah, we'll, we'll, we're giving away two ashtrays tomorrow. I'm going to have a, a wheel. I've, I've found an app that I will have a wheel that is absolutely random, and we'll we'll absolutely do that. So, thank you, Sean, for asking that. Sean he might have he might have tuned better. in the entire time just for that. He, he says you're killing me. Better to do. You're killing sorry, me. Sorry, bro. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys very much. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you for everyone participating. And, and Michael and Kylie, thank you for being a part of the Bourbon and BS podcast. Guys, uh, stay tuned. We'll have more information about next week's episode. 
Um, but guys, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. I had a lot of takeaways. I hope everyone else did as well. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Be safe. Yeah. Cheers.